I'm a 20-something female student at a pretty big university in the Midwest. I work as a desk clerk at one of the student libraries. I basically check books and equipment in and out, give directions for the building and area, and help the patrons with what they may need. I'm also quite talkative and friendly, and that makes me a good customer service employee, one that people will stop to chat with. I know all the regulars by name, and most of the people I see in the library are really great people. Most. One night around 9pm, another library employee, Mark, shows up to chat. He works in another department that has him walking all around the building, so he frequently passes my desk and says hi. I had a headache, so I really wasn't up for casual conversation, and knowing Mark pretty well, I told him that I wasn't feeling very well and was eager to get off of work soon. He wished me well and went off on his way. During this exchange, a patron had come up behind Mark to wait for my attention, which was normal considering I work at the front desk. As Mark leaves, the man steps up to take his place in front of my desk and just stares at me for a second with an uneasy smile on his face. I'd seen him a few times mulling around the library in recent weeks. He usually just sat in the cafe area reading a local paper. He looked to be about mid-thirties and wore pretty nice clothes, so I didn't think he was homeless or anything like that. He said he overheard that I wasn't feeling well and asked if I wanted him to grab me a drink from the vending machine down the hall as the cafe closed at eight. I politely declined obviously not wanting to take drinks of any kind from strangers. He seemed a little miffed, but didn't mention it. He then said he also overheard that I got off soon, and asked if I wanted him to walk me to my car. Becoming wary and alert, I again declined and started to consider my options for escape. The desk is only staffed by one person at a time on weeknights, and considering it's the spring semester, there are just not a lot of people around the library. With no co-workers to cover the desk for me, I can't leave. My boss works up on the second floor in the admin offices, but I know my favorite supervisor isn't working today. This meant I couldn't get a supervisor down here without a legitimate reason. Even if I call upstairs, I can't very well explain the situation over the phone because it's literally right next to me, and this guy would overhear everything. Who knows what he would have done? Not really sure what to do next, I turn around to hide the confusion and fear on my face. I stood and grabbed the disinfectant wipes and began wiping the counters, just to have a job to do rather than sit idly with this creep standing at my desk. I'd only been turned away from him for less than a minute, when I heard keyboard clicks at my computer. I whirled around and see that he has my Facebook page open. He must have done some keyboard command to switch tabs, because my Facebook was open and logged in, but in a different tab when I left the computer. Now this is obviously very bad, because now this guy has my first and last name. Shit. At this point, I'm scared, but honestly, in the moment, I was just pissed off. I asked him what he was doing, as he turned the monitor at an angle so he could see the screen and was analyzing my profile. He then said, Oh, so your name is Abigail Watson. Nice to meet you. Obviously I couldn't lie and say it was someone else. I mean my profile picture is my face for Christ's sake. This shit really got to me. I told him how rude that was and how it was an invasion of privacy. He responded by saying it was on a public computer, so it was public property. Yeah, fucking right. He made a move toward me and leaned over the desk a bit and tried to grab my arm. I was about to start getting heated when Mark came down the stairs, saying he'd heard me from the stairwell. I must have been talking pretty loud at this point. I was visibly pissed, as Mark could see. As I explained that he'd try to buy me a drink and walk me to my car, and went as far as basically stealing my personal information from my Facebook page. Now also pissed at this point, Mark stepped right up into the guy's face. Mark's a pretty big, burly guy. He told him to forget my name, my face, 
and get the hell out of there. The creeper guy put his hands up and smirked as he took a few steps back with the old, Hey man, it's cool. I'm just trying to make some friends out here. I scoffed audibly. I told him I'd be calling building security if I saw him at my desk again. He told me to fuck off and called me ugly before storming off and leaving. Mark asked if I was okay. I asked him to cover the desk for a few minutes while I went up and explained what happened to my boss. He was also pretty pissed at this guy and told me he'd get security to look at the camera footage to maybe ID this creep and that he'd be banned if he showed up again. Turns out he was a student here a while back and had a history of stalking female students. Fucking gross. I haven't seen him since. I called campus police, but never really heard back. Mark now makes rounds to my dad's when I work nights. Me, my sister and my mom have been trying to make sense of this for the past couple of hours and the facts get less comforting the more we compare our experiences of that night. So last Friday night, I was home alone while my family stayed in their cabin a few kilometers away. I'm used to staying home alone as this exact scenario is very common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore. I'm used to the odd creaks and settling noises of our house. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night, and most noises could be attributed to him. If anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the doors or windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12 a.m. were disconcerting, to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I am still terrified of the premise of a break-in or some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long. I finally got out of bed and walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment, until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep. I saw the door open, about two or three inches. I froze. I'd let our dog boss go out earlier that night but I know I closed the door. I've never left this door open. I'm a paranoid person with bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins and the like, so I would never, home alone, forget to close the door. I am 100% certain. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open because I knew it would send me into a spiral possibly even an anxiety or panic attack, if I didn't explain it this way. I closed and locked the door, double-checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, I looked around the entire second floor of my three-floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease. And upon finding nothing, I went back downstairs to my room. As I was down there, trying to push away the fear. I could hear Bosco walking around the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps, accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2 a.m. the same night, my sister comes home from work. I woke up a few times before this to Bosco in the basement, whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in. 
We let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days. I forgot to mention it to anyone until tonight. My sister and my mom were home with me for a movie night while my dad and brother stayed at the cabin. I remember the door situation when we were picking out horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again. The same door that was locked from the inside and had not opened since earlier that night. My stomach dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. Maybe she let Bosco out and forgot to close it, until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then we were trying to justify a reason someone would break in to not steal anything, and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then this hypothetical person would be trapped up there now, knowing that this house was not empty, and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister in the bathroom, they ran out of the glass door, which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more, much wider than when I had found it, as though they were only in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, either way it ties too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing, or just breaking and enterings many, many times. So it's not as unlikely as it may be in a bigger city. I can't make sense of this. I'm shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone in the basement. There is a part of me that doesn't believe it but I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is. Okay, so this happened about a year ago. I'm in a long distance relationship and I often fly to visit. I didn't have a ride arranged to come pick me up so I usually use Lyft or Uber to get to and from the airport. This particular ride started off fine. The guy was from Haiti, I believe he said, so he had a very thick accent that was often hard to understand. The beginning of the ride was him just making small talk, like most drivers do. Where are you flying from? Are you in college? Do you have family here? And so on. We get on the freeway, and there's lots of traffic, I had a layover flight, and of course all the outlets were in use, so I couldn't charge my phone. I'm hoping this traffic lightens up, because I really need to keep in contact with the people I'm going to be staying with. Of course, with my luck, the app crashes and says, you have arrived. While we were literally in the middle of the freeway with no houses near us at all, I get kind of annoyed, and the driver says he'll pull over at this Walmart nearby to figure out what's wrong. Apparently, he had a very old phone and it wasn't giving proper directions, so I said we could use mine, but I needed to charge it. He asked me to sit up front so it was easier, and I thought nothing of it, so I did go up front. He tells me he will take me the rest of the way for free without using the lift app. I put the address in and we're back on our way. As we're pulling out of the Walmart parking lot, he asks me how old I am. I told him I just turned 18, and that's when things got kind of weird. He seemed to lighten up at how young I was, which was a bit odd, but whatever. 
He then asks me a series of questions like, Why don't you live here in this state? You should move here. You could go to college here, so why don't you? I'm a doctor, and Lent is just a side job, so I have money. This man was at least in his mid-forties. I told him I had no money to just randomly move states and start college, seeing as I had just become a legal adult. He then told me, I can take care of you. I'll buy you a little apartment and a nice car, and take you out and pay for your college. I thought he was joking, so I kind of just awkwardly laughed and said that it's okay. He didn't need to do that. But he kept insisting, and I was getting kind of creeped out. I really didn't want to jump to conclusions. I thought maybe he's just not sure how to hold a proper conversation, being as he's not from the country or something. About 20 minutes later, we're about 5 minutes from my destination. My phone kept doing that annoying, charging, not charging, that phones do, when the charger wires are loose. I had this phone a while, so it did this at times, and apparently hadn't been charging much, and it died. Since we were so close to the destination though, I told him I knew the rest of the way, but I'd tell him to turn right, and he'd say okay, and purposely turn left or keep going straight. Anything but what I told him to do. Now we're lost because he's ignoring everything I'm saying, and playing it off as an accident. I'm not super familiar with the entire area, I only knew a small portion of the streets. He tells me he lives nearby and I start getting really scared because I think he's going to kidnap me or something. I let out a single tear and then I tell myself to keep it together because in the movies, whenever they see fear, they get mad or something. So I'm trying to make it seem like I'm not losing my shit. Finally, he turns back around and when we're almost there again, he once more starts going the wrong way. At this point, I got my phone to about 5%. He reaches over while at a red light and grabs my phone. He rates himself 5 stars on Lyft and friends me on Facebook. He also puts his number in my phone and tells me to call him if I ever need anything and that we should go out sometime. I give a little fake smile so he doesn't know I'm about to shit myself from fear. Eventually I get so fed up, I just jump out at another red light and tell him, Thanks, but you're really scaring me. Bye. I call my boyfriend on my 5% battery line and tell him where I am because I'm really scared and I need him to pick me up. My Lyft driver is shouting out the window for me to get back into the car, but there's no way in hell I was going back in there to be some mad sugar baby that was also a total stranger at that. I go somewhere with lots of people and wait for my boyfriend. This whole ordeal made the ride last about two and a half hours. It should have taken 45 minutes, even with the traffic. Later I called Lyft and told him everything. He was supposedly fired, so that's good. I went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night, I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail, so there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid-twenties walked by, carrying a fishing pole and small cooler. I didn't think much of it, but five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came to say hi. I said hi and went back to reading, but then, without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy amused tone like, so you're just reading, and then looked behind me and noticed my tent and then said, oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words, or tell him I was trying to be alone to get him to leave. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark, 
and just drilling into me. I just responded to it with, uh-huh, and yeah. I just tried to pretend I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks a beer and lights a cigarette, and he starts blowing it at me. At this point, I'm so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wanders by, and he strikes up conversation with him. I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend to need to get water. I went to the shore and filtered some water really slowly. I saw the man walk away and go sit with the new guy, which made me feel really relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent, and for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was watching the sunset and also loosely organizing my things. When he popped out from behind my tent, he stood maybe about a foot away from my door, looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but just started laughing really creepily. I asked, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I felt sick to my stomach and finally responded with, I'm taking a nap now, so have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily laughed. Later I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name. Well, at least what was written on his cooler. I'd also overheard him say where he was from to the other hiker, so I put that down in my notes app on my phone, just in case. I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving the camp that night, but ended up staying and just leaving really early in the morning in case he came back. Normally, while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not that bad as you're hearing it, but this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the back country. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, but hopefully somewhere far away from that guy. This happened many years ago. I was eight or so at the time, and every day I would walk home from my elementary school. My house was a few miles down the road, so my mother thought it would be safe enough for me to walk by myself. It was a few months into the school year when it started happening. A beat-up Toyota would slow down enough for a couple of white guys that looked like they were in their mid-twenties to follow me and yell insults at me. I was chubby back then, so they would call me fat and much more hurtful things. I'll always remember the driver. He looked to be the oldest in the bunch with greasy blonde hair hanging down and partially covering his pimpled, scarred face. They would follow me until I reached the gas station that was halfway along my journey home. Then they would speed off, laughing loudly. For the first couple of weeks, I didn't tell anyone, thinking they would get tired of it. They didn't. A full month passed before I told my mother about it. She, of course, was rightly concerned about me and asked me how long it had been going on for. When I told her a month, she grew even more concerned. Her, being a single mom, couldn't pick me up from school because she was at work all day, so her solution was to send my older brother to meet me halfway. She thought it would deter them. It didn't. Another four months went by with them continuing to follow me and throw insults at me. Then suddenly it stopped. A whole month went by without them driving by, and we thought everything was safe again. We were wrong. Suddenly, out of the blue, I saw the old beat-up Toyota heading down the road towards me. Only the driver was in the car this time. He slowed down, flung open the passenger door, and proceeded to yell for me to get into the car. I was so scared I couldn't even speak. I just shook my head no and tried to walk faster. He continued to follow me, demanding that I get into his car. I'll never forget the look on his face as he yelled at me. It was so full of rage. We finally got to the gas station and I made a break for it. 
I ran inside the gas station and up to the gas station attendant. I told him what was happening and he let me hide behind the counter. The driver pulled into the gas station, hopped out of the car and came in. He demanded that the gas station attendant tell him where I was, claiming I was his daughter and I jumped out of his car. The gas station attendant glanced down at me and I shook my head wildly mouthing that I did not know this man. The gas station attendant said he didn't know what he was talking about and that he had to leave the store immediately. The driver began to yell wildly and start walking around the store looking for me. The gas station attendant said he was going to call the police if he did not leave. The man turned to him and said something I'll never forget. I'll get that bitch one way or another. The driver stormed out at the gas station and left. I sat there on the floor, crying for what felt like hours. The gas station attendant called the police and had them come over. When the police arrived, the attendant told them what had happened. A police officer knelt down beside me and asked me my side of the story. I told the officer everything. How him and a couple of others had been following me for months. How they would follow me and insult me. How they suddenly stopped. And how he tried to get me into his car. I don't remember much afterwards other than them calling my mother and her meeting at our house. They took my mother's statement and then left. After that, my mother changed her work hours in order to come get me every day. For years I lived in fear that the man with greasy hair and pimple-scarred face would eventually get me. So, to the man who followed me for months, insulting me, and eventually trying to get me into his car. I'm not that scared little girl anymore. We better never meet. So, I moved into this place a couple of months ago with my parents. We also have a dog. A couple of weeks after we moved in, I tried to open the attic door. There was no ladder. Just with a broom, it almost opened and halfway dropped, but it seemed like it was being held up by someone. I didn't bother and thought it could have just been stuck. Two weeks later, I go back to look at the attic, and the door is in the spot that it was originally in. Weird, I thought. A month or so later, my dog usually doesn't have problems with me, and my family leave the house. But now there's something up with my dog. She will hide under the table and start to panic. At night, I usually hear footsteps and loud bangs sometimes. My parents are deep sleepers and don't wake up during the night, so I know it's not them. When I wake up, I go to check out the loud bangs, but nothing has fallen. I don't know if I'm going crazy or I'm just nervous. I went around my house checking any closets and crawl spaces. I didn't find anything. After that, I went to try to open the attic door, but it seems like it's been boarded up, like shut from the inside. It could have been the old owners, or there is someone in my attic. I decided to call the police. They sent out some officers to check it out. Upon inspecting the attic, the police found a sleeping bag and a ton of boxes full of stuff, but they didn't find anyone. I'm thinking it could have been the old owner's stuff. Or at some point, there was someone in my attic. I'm really shocked, but comforted that there's nobody currently in my attic. My parents and I are going to board up the attic to make sure nothing like this happens again. I moved out of state to a very small town. The first day of moving in, a neighbor walking his dog greets me and introduces himself to me. He gives me a quick rundown that the neighborhood is filled with tweakers and other shady types. I took that as a general warning that that may be all I'll deal with. A few months later, he invited me over to his place to teach me how to do some woodwork. As we're making a shelf for my cat to sit on, He's asking me questions. 
to me, they were normal everyday questions. But looking back, I realize now he was trying to get information out of me. Why did you move out here from out of state? Who lives with you? Do you have any other family members in the state or area? Once we were done, we went to install the shelf, and he met my mom, who stays with me. He talks to her for a bit, and then we left to walk back to his place. He starts telling me that he can see our yard from his place, and notices that I barely go outside with my dogs. He told me not to worry that if someone breaks into our place, that he can see them and shoot them from his room. That's when I'm thinking, how is that possible? Because you live over half a block away. Before I can question him, he asks if I want to see more of the town. I'm like, yeah, let's go. He walks out to his car and pulls something out from the middle compartment and then tells me to go in his pickup truck. So I do while he's filling the gas tank up with some gasoline. Once he's done, he walks over to the driver's side and opens the door. He drops a holster between us. He tells me not to worry about it as I look, trying to see if there's a gun or not. As we're driving, I realized he hasn't said a word for five minutes, and this guy loves to hear his own voice. Another thing I noticed is that we're on a dirt road, and I haven't seen a single house, trailer, or vehicle for a while. I guess I gave off some nervous vibes because he suddenly says, So yeah, unless you know where you're going out here, you'll get lost, and it's best to have a pickup or ATV to drive out here. After about another 10 minutes of silent driving, we get to a little creek. Luckily there was another truck there. All he says is, Oh, look at that. Someone else is here with us, and he grabs his holster and gets out. We both see a lady with a big dog playing in the water. She turns to us as she sees him walking closer to her. She gestures to his holster, and he tells her not to worry, that it's for the snakes. She lifts her shirt above her waist to show her gun, and she tells him she's not worried one bit. They talk for a few minutes, and she tells him that her husband is home waiting for her to make dinner. She's just out letting the dog have some playtime. The neighbor changes his tone and posture from confident to defensive now. She called her dog and they went to their truck. He's watching her and she hasn't started her truck yet. A few minutes pass and he tells me it's time to go too. When we get to his truck, she drives off. The drive back, I start to get uneasy and creeped out. Why would he drive me all the way out there and just leave? Why tell me not to worry about the holstered gun, but tell the lady what it's for? I finally get out of my head and just break the silence and give him my life story as to why I moved. Finally, he responds that he can relate to my story and gives me a rundown of how the town is and what it's about, and that some people are more racist than others, and I should watch my back for that. Once we get back to his place, I tell him I have stuff to take care of at home, and I nope the hell out of there. I said to myself, if I'm ever going to hang out with him again, it won't be alone. I'm an 18-year-old kid in culinary school. This happened back in 2009. Our program has an underground parking lot attached to a lounge of our own, located behind the cafeteria. Couples like going there because it's always empty and partially dark. I hated it because it had a back door leading to the parking lot that was barely lit up. Barely anyone parked there, and so I found it creepy. Plus being a horror fan, I knew that that was a perfect opportunity for things to go wrong. Long story short, I come out of class one day, and this kid I don't know starts walking up to me, almost confrontational-like. I have my knife set with me, and pull out a handle, readying to defend myself. He stops and hands me a paper. It reads, Meet me in the lounge. I look at him in confusion, and ask who sent him the note. Was it my boyfriend, or someone in the culinary program, or maybe a friend from high school? 
He shakes his head and says he doesn't know, but I should go. I question him on what this person looks like, and he refuses to give me any information. I chuckle nervously, put the note in my pocket, and walk past this kid to head to class. He starts following me, asking me if I'm gonna go. I try ignoring him, heading towards the library to get into a public place. He follows. He tries telling me I should go, that it's my destiny or some shit along those lines. I glare at him and pick up the pace, trying to head downstairs to the cafeteria in hopes of finding a classmate and losing the kid. He runs at the same pace, telling me he doesn't understand why I'm not going. I tell him, because I don't want to, now go away, and I head into the cafeteria. By now, he's really creeping me out. I grab for my phone to call the police, but instead see a classmate and run towards him. The kid follows me, pointing towards where the lounge is and telling me I'm going the wrong way. I instantly panic and tell my classmate what's going on. He approaches the kid and tells him to leave me alone, that I have a boyfriend and I'm not interested. The kid tells me that they're waiting for me in the lounge and not to take too long. His words just gave me chills. My classmate walks me to our student restaurant and asks for some others to come with us. Three of my other colleagues come with us to the lounge. There's no one there. I get freaked out and decide I need to go home. They walk me through the campus to the parking lot, where I can call my parents to get a ride. One of the others stays with me while the classmate who defended me goes to report the behavior to our teachers, who use the lounge as a secondary office sometimes. He then comes back to tell me that they're going to investigate and keep an eye out for suspicious activity, or that kid. A few days later, I learned that a girl had been assaulted in that area, having parked there during finals and gone in through the lounge. The school newspaper had reported it, but there were no details as to who did it to her, and if they were caught. I felt my stomach drop, hoping that the girl was okay and hoping that those people get caught. I reported my incident to the newspaper team, but they claim she never dealt with anything like a note. They never found the suspects. My mom is glad I listened to my gut and did not go. To this day, I still get chills thinking about it. The girl recovered and escaped with a few minor injuries. They never caught the attackers, and I never saw that strange kid again. All I can think of is, why me? If they were going for money, I was so poor I literally lived off sesame crackers donated by classmates because I had no money. I'm just glad the girl is okay and that I listen to my gut. Who knows what would have happened if I gone. This happened back in the 90s when I was still in primary school. I really had no clue how much danger I was in. I would have been around 11 years old, living in a regional city of Australia. For the last year, I'd been having a lot of trouble at school, getting bullied a bit by classmates, and felt really singled out by my teacher. My mom worked around the corner from my school, so when everything would get too much at school, I would literally just walk out of class down the road and onto her work site. It would take me about half an hour to walk there, along a main road. A couple of times I noticed a small white car driving past me slowly, but I only noticed this because I would see the same car go up and down the street as I was walking, and while I was sitting outside of my mom's work site. After a while, I started seeing the same car driving up my street at home, and parked along the streets that my brother and I would ride our bikes around in. I don't remember thinking it was strange, because it was a small town, and it wasn't unusual to see the same cars or people. It was just like, oh, there goes that car again. Anyway, my family followed a serious routine. Mondays swimming and tutoring. 
Tuesdays, netball training. Wednesdays, netball game. Thursdays, basketball training. Fridays, we would go and see professional basketball or football, depending on the season. Saturday was my brother's basketball games. And Sundays were our day to go to the river with friends for swimming and a barbecue lunch. It never changed unless someone was sick. So one Friday night, I'm getting dressed and ready to go watch the basketball game, but I can't find my shoes. I'm pretty sure that they're in the car, which is in a garage under our two-story house. To get it, I would have to walk down the outside steps at the front of the house, which has a full view of the road. I walk out the front door, and at the end of our driveway is a small, white car. Now I've never taken that much notice of the white cars up until this point, and it wasn't uncommon for cars to be parked in this exact spot for our neighbors, but I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach when I looked at it. I kept walking down the stairs, and as I got close to the bottom, the driver's side door opens, and the man gets out quickly. I keep walking to the garage, and he starts moving toward our driveway. That was the point when something inside me just told me to scream for my parents and run and lock myself in the car. I did exactly that. And then this guy turned around, ran back to his car, and drove off. By the time my parents came out, there was no evidence that this had happened, and they didn't believe me. A week later, there was a notice in our school newsletter about a man in a white car attempting to abduct another child from my school on the same night. My parents were very shaken and took me seriously after reading that. I don't believe he was ever caught, but it definitely taught me to listen to my intuition and to take notice of my surroundings. My family and I went on a trip to the Hocking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I've never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We start driving and it's, for lack of better words, Real impoverished where we are driving, hills have eyes ask. We literally only see a few cars on the way there, and are on the back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest, and we're close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Baba Wood. For a bit of additional information, I drive a Mercedes that I'm just lucky to have, and have my husband in the car. I also have my 10-year-old non-verbal autistic son, and my six-year-old daughter. We drive down this real creepy stone road into the forest, and there's nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody. We see signs that were close and pull into the parking lot. We walk over the footbridge and make our way toward the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel toward us while we're on foot. The man gets out of the truck with a chainsaw. It's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go and through the tunnel. I try to make small talk with him and get some information. Things like if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources and that kind of thing. But he really wasn't budging. We turn around to walk out of the tunnel and he starts using the chainsaw behind us. The sound is just echoing through this tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service, and literally no one knows my family is out there, except for us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people, like we have money or something, which we don't. We rush to the car to get the kids in their booster seats, and this man comes driving over the footbridge in his truck toward us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fit on it. He stops again, gets out of his truck, and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. About this time, I notice there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his, 
and we compared his hands and my son's. They were not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there. We get out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later, I look in my rearview mirror and there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us. And there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch up to us like that. There's nowhere to go in these woods. The road is basically one lane and we have no cell service or GPS. Every time I think we lose him, he's there again. I'm waiting for my tires to get popped or something, or for this guy to ram me off the road and into the ravine in the woods. Finally we get out of the woods, and it turns out he's still following us. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making a wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone, and I turned around to go past the stone road that goes to the forest. There's one lone house near this road, and there is his truck, parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods, and taken a back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. This is a story from 2019, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I guess due to trauma. I was bored at home alone. I FaceTimed with my best friend and asked him if he would like to join me for a walk in the neighborhood. He wasn't there. He was on his way back from school, which is understandable, because it was a Thursday afternoon. Due to my massive boredom, I put on my sports clothes, a basic t-shirt, and some shorts that have no pockets. I then was headed with my music, vibing to the circuit. Arriving there, it was surprisingly not that empty. There were around 8-10 to 10 people in that 15 kilometer circuit. I started walking for a bit, then ran for a couple of kilometers, and then laid down in the grass. I noticed two guys on a motorcycle going back and forth. I didn't care that much since I was facetiming my two best friends. It was getting late, I think it was around 6pm, and I was exhausted. I walked home, but I took another path that's kind of a shortcut. I had to walk through an empty big street with buildings and construction. I had a feeling that someone was watching me and following me. I turned around and noticed the same two guys on that motorcycle heading toward me. I whispered to my friends on FaceTime that something weird's going to happen and that they have to cut their mics and focus with me. The guys came by and one of them asked me where the nearest barbershop is. Out of stress, I gave them a random location. While the rider of the bike asked me about the barbershop, my right eye twitched and unfocused, but I was still able to see with it. I saw in the bike's rearview mirror that the other guy was trying to look at where my phone was located. I was freaking out. Time was starting to slow down. Seconds felt like hours and I couldn't feel my legs anymore. They went on, but with a slow speed. It was like they were planning a backup plan. I had three options. Number one, there was a taxi guy fixing his car. I could have went to him and explained the situation, but my gut said what if they noticed me, came back, and maybe do what they planned to do. Number two, stop a random car, hop in, and then explain the situation. My gut said no, what if the car was locked? Plus the guys would have noticed that I knew they were planning to do something, and they might have come to me after the random car goes. And number three, this is what I chose. Run in the opposite direction into traffic and take the path that I came by. I instinctively ran for five straight minutes. I couldn't do it anymore. I entered a field and started running again to some slums. I looked back and I saw the guys coming after me into the field. One of them was shouting, Just stop. We just want to know where the barbershop is. There's one thing about me, and it's that I always trust my gut. And it said, no, run as fast as you can, or you will die today. And that's what I did. I ran between the slums and kept running until I arrived near my best friend's house. I told him to come down the stairs right now, and I laid down in the parking lot. He came to me and was freaked out, because he knew that something was happening. 
but he didn't know what since I didn't give him more information. My face turned yellowish and I threw up. I couldn't feel my legs or my arms anymore. He walked me to my house and I laid down, and from that moment, I don't remember anything. I just remember me waking up the following day with bruises on my leg due to me running in the field full of pikes. For a bit of background information about me, I have PD, panic disorder. For those who don't know what it is, it's a mental illness that causes extreme anxiety, severe panic attacks, and a slew of other problems. I've been suffering from this for over a year now, and while it's getting better, it's still very difficult to deal with. Keep this in mind. My husband and I have been married a little over a year now. The time we were married, unfortunately, I was undergoing medical issues that no doctors could seem to explain. I was having panic attacks all the time, and they would be so severe, I would have to be taken to the ER, where they would have to literally sedate me to calm me down. I was also losing weight at an exponential and scary rate, becoming sicker and sicker as time went on. Not even a month after we married, I lost my job and was homebound while my husband worked second shift, which was 4 p.m. to 3 a.m. He would arrive home at around 4 a.m., leaving me alone most of the time. My parents and younger brother live close by, perhaps a 10-minute drive at most, but at the moment, my mother and father were unable to watch over me. They called as frequently as they could, but that was all they could do. In May, I was told by doctors that I was literally at death's door, and unless something happened quick, my family was going to lose me. I was given medications to help with the panic attacks. They were to get me to eat and stuff like that. They wanted to hospitalize me, but I refused. My parents decided that when they and my younger brother went to Florida the next month, they were taking me with them. Again, Keep in mind, I am both anxious and extremely sick. Around this time, the real issues began. Not with me, but with our neighbors. You see, we've never actually met our neighbors personally. My husband lived in the trailer for a month on his own before we married, and he always said they were odd, but they didn't seem to be of any concern. However, once I came into the picture, that changed. The person who lived in the trailer before us was actually a cousin of mine, who rented from another cousin and his wife, who lived states away. Nora was a huge druggie and a drug dealer, so people got used to getting their fixes and drugs at the trailer we now live in. Then, a few months before we moved in, she got in trouble with the law and landed in jail for some time. I guess our neighbors, who, according to our landlords, were drug addicts and raging alcoholics as well. Thought that perhaps she was back. I'm not quite sure. I suppose this is because from where I was so sick, and my husband slept when he could from working odd hours and taking care of me, so they never actually saw us. They just knew someone was there. They became active at night. During the day, they were predominantly quiet. Every once in a while, they would do something outside but for the most part, nothing really happened. It was always after my husband left for work. My car was still there, which should have told them at least someone was still home. It started off innocently enough, driving up and down in front of the house, parking in the road directly in front of it and waiting. They'd honked the horn, but I ignored them. Several times I called my parents, asking them what to do. They said for the time to just ignore them, because maybe they thought Nora was back, and after some time, they get the hint it was new people and leave me alone. So, I did just that, for a time. When they started driving up the driveway and stopping at the porch, that's when I first called the cops. All I was told was that as long as they didn't encroach on my actual property, there was nothing they could do. They advised me to turn on the lights to my house, signaling I was home. 
I couldn't sleep, despite needing to. I had mono and panic disorders and depression. I desperately needed sleep. My husband had the weekends off, and you can guess it. No issues during the weekends. It was insane and infuriating. Everyone believed me when I said I was having problems, but there was only so much they could do. My father-in-law brought over one of his shotguns, a 12-gauge, knowing that I was a good shot. He told me to use it if need be. For a bit more information about that, is I shot trap for years. When I was 18, I played second in districts. I chose not to go to state. But knowing I was good enough for second was a proud moment for me. My father-in-law made me promise I would use it if it came to it, so I did. One night, my husband was at work, and I guess my body finally shut off. I fell asleep for once, only to be woken up at around 1am by the sound of our neighbor's truck tearing out from behind the trailer. I jumped up, looked outside to see them driving out of our driveway. They started speeding up and down the front of the house, and I called the cops again. I called my dad and mom, and my dad came over because I was in full panic attack. My dad called my husband, who came home immediately. There were tire marks in the grass behind our trailer, but they couldn't necessarily prove it was them, despite me describing their truck down to the dents. My dad told the cops this has been going on long enough. But again, there was not enough evidence or proof. A week. Just one more week until I could go with my family to Florida. I somehow managed to be a bridesmaid in my older brother's wedding, despite being so sick. I was doped up on medications to keep me calm, so I wouldn't have a panic attack. And to be honest, I don't recall much about that day other than it poured rain. My husband, naturally, was at work. I was sitting at home, our two cats asleep rather soundly. I was playing on my 3DS with Markiplier on the TV for background noise. The time was around midnight, when my cat suddenly woke up and came unglued. They ran to the side door, then to the front door, growling and hissing, their hair on end. They had never behaved that way, so I started to get up to see what it was they were freaking out about when I heard it. How are we going to do this? I froze. I heard them. I heard their footsteps as they walked up and down the front porch. I wasn't sure how many there were, but I know for a fact there were at least three men outside. My curtains were closed, and most of the lights were off, but the TV was on. Surely they could hear Markiplier's eccentric volume. In. Maybe. I'm not is what I could make out. They'd gotten quieter. I heard their footsteps on the porch again. I grabbed my phone, shakily swiping until I found my dad's number, and I called him. I remember breathing hard, feeling a panic attack setting in. Hello? They're here. They're here. I remember sobbing. On the porch. Daddy. They want to get in. I'm on my way. Call the cops. I hung up, and then I heard them talking amongst themselves on how they wanted to break in, what they wanted, and a few other things. I ran into the bedroom, grabbed the 12 gauge, opened the chamber to see if it was fully loaded, and then called the cops. I left the lights off. I decided I was going to have them caught this time. I wasn't going to run them off. The dispatch answered, and I told them what was going on. As sick as I was, I managed to hold that shotgun to my shoulder, pointed at the door, remembering everything my dad taught me about shooting while I was a hunter and when I shot trap, but I was still scared out my mind. Somehow, I kept my panic attack down, but I was still breathing hard. Calm your breathing, hun. You said they're outside. Yes, I heard one of them say they heard me, then the other one said that. It wouldn't be a problem. Oh my god. They're coming, sweetie. I promise. I'm armed. Excuse me? I'm armed, I yelled, hoping that they'd hear. With what, sweetheart? The 12-gauge. They want to hurt me. 
I'm not gonna let them. She's armed. I heard dispatch tell the police, who I suppose were on their way. I heard armed from one of the guys outside, and in silence. Ma'am? I can't. I heard their footsteps, leaving. Then I saw the lights to my dad's truck. My dad's here. I lowered the shotgun and ran outside. My dad and younger brother running out of the truck. My dad had the judge in his hand, which is a pistol that shoots 12-gauge rounds, while my younger brother was holding a knife. It's my dad and my brother. They're armed too. Okay, what of the men? I don't see them. When the cops get there, disarm yourselves, okay? I thank the dispatcher for everything, and about this time, the cops pulled up. I told my dad and younger brother to disarm. So they put their weapons in the truck while I took my gun inside and sat it in the kitchen on top of our dinner table. My dad told me to get back in the house and for my younger brother to go with me. As soon as I stepped inside, the panic attack hit. My dad came inside for a moment and hugged me, telling me how brave I'd been, especially for holding it as long as I did. Shaking, crying, grasping for breath. I listened as he went back outside. The cops had found footprints, an entire area on the porch where the men had tried to break in at one point, but the men had scattered, leaving it difficult for the cops to trace exactly where they came from. My dad told them it was the neighbors, and my landlords actually called and told the cops it was more than likely our neighbors as well, who had apparently been giving my cousin, who lives up the road, a difficult time as well. The cops noticed some of the footprints went into the neighbor's yard, but they weren't home, of course. I remember my dad and younger brother standing outside, just as the cops pulled in, yelling as loudly as they could that they would drop them if they ever so much saw them around me again. Enough is enough, my dad yelled over and over. She's sick. She needs rest. Leave her the hell alone. I'll drop your ass, I swear to God. And I noticed he was crying. My dad isn't the type of person to do that. My whole life, I've seen my dad cry maybe a handful of times. When he talked about his deceased father. When my mom's mom died. When the doctors told me I was on death's door. When my younger brother was born. My dad had been scared that he wouldn't get there in time. And maybe, just maybe... I would hesitate to protect myself. But I had made my mind up. I wasn't going to let them get away with it anymore. That night, my husband came home from work and hugged me so tightly, I really thought my lungs would burst. My younger brother texted him what was going on, but reassured him I was okay. A week later, I went to Florida. Time went on, and I'm still getting better. As for my neighbors... I've never had problems from them again. I'm not sure if it was the cops actually going to their house, or if it was my dad and younger brother threatening them. Or maybe it was me, them hearing me saying that I was armed. I don't know. I don't care. They are still there, but I know they won't do anything ever again. So for a bit of context first, my cat likes to go outside every day. In the morning, he follows us to the door, takes the elevator down with us, and then goes about his day outside, until we bring him back home again in the evening. Now, my cat isn't the most punctual guy, so it's pretty common for him to stay much later in the neighborhood, or he gets bored and doesn't play for more than two hours and wants to go back inside. The problem is that we're not home, so he just has to wait. My family and I live in an apartment on the first floor, so my cat's solution is to sit under one of our balconies and meow at the top of his lungs to get our attention. When we're home, it works perfectly fine, but when we're not, it's a lot less effective. So our solution was to gently ask our neighbors that have the key to our apartment to bring him up so he doesn't have to wait outside all day. Those that don't have the key sometimes let him inside the building so he's not literally outside. 
Our apartment is a bit special because it's bigger than the others. So to get inside, there are two ways when you get to the main hall. Number one, take the stairs to the left and open the door that has two locks. Number two, use the elevator that goes directly inside our apartment. The cat is used to the second option, but when the neighbors that don't have the key let him inside the building, he goes up the stairs and waits, since I usually use the elevator from the parking lot, and that means I don't see him waiting in the hall, and he meows outside the door to get me to open up for him. All around, we have our habits with my parents and neighbors, and it works fairly well. Now you know how everything goes with my little guy. Anyway, here's what happened a while ago. My parents like the outdoors very much, so I'm usually left alone on the weekends. Generally, it means taking care of the chores and inviting my friends over so we can have the apartment to ourselves. That's pretty nice. This time I was alone. It was late, at about 11pm-ish. I was just chilling in the living room before hearing meowing over the sound of the TV. Someone let my cat in the building and he's waiting outside the door. I took my keys and started opening the first lock. I don't know about other pet owners, but I know my cat's meows by heart. It's kind of a rising meow that's very high-pitched and very cute, and that also has a specific rhythm, because I've been hearing it nearly every day for five years. So I stopped. The noise isn't what it usually is. It's too deep and just off. This isn't my cat outside my door and he's the only cat around that knows he has to wait by the door and scream to be let inside. By that point, I stopped halfway through opening the door and waited to hear him again and noticed scratching. My cat never scratches that door. At that point, I'm really weirded out by the situation, but the meowing is getting really loud and I didn't want the neighbors to be woken up, so I continued with my key. But suddenly, I heard another noise that freaked me out. A cough. For the record, I'm not a very cautious person, and in my whole 21 years of living in this apartment, I must have looked in the peephole a total of maybe five times. But a small part of my brain told me to do it that night, and thank God it did. So, I let go of my keys and put my eyes against the door, and I saw it. A man standing there, fucking meowing in front of my door. To say that I was terrified is really an understatement, but my heart stopped. I just stood there, petrified for what felt like an hour. I don't really know how long it took me to move again, but eventually my body just took over, I guess. I did what you'd expect, ran for my phone, stood in the corner of the living room and called the police. By the time they came, there was nobody in front of the door. They just took my statement before telling me to be cautious and then left. To this day, I still don't know what that meowing guy wanted. I also don't know how he got inside the building since he needed a key to access it, and also how he knew that I would open the door if he imitated my cat in front of it. At least I will be careful from now on. Oh. And in case you're worried, my cat eventually came back since then. This happened a few years ago. Just to clarify, we live in a pretty good neighborhood. To show you how safe it is, a few days before this happened, my dad took me to my drumming lesson. We were gone for about an hour, and when we came back home, we realized we'd left the key in the lock outside the whole time. No one took it or came in. This has happened before. Now, on to the actual story. One night at about 11pm, my mom and I were in the sitting room. My dad and my sister were in bed. My mom was asleep on the couch, and I was playing PUBG Mobile. At one point, I could hear noises coming from the hallway. Thinking it was the cats, I brushed it off. I started to hear more noise and thought, what the fuck are they doing? Then, I saw something roll on the floor by the dining table, 
and one of the cats walking up to it, again thinking it was the cats. The object, however, was placed on top of a vanity we have in the hallway. They don't go on top of that, but we do have a 9-10 to tenth month old curious kitten. I then heard a male voice. I thought it might be one of my teammates in the game talking. I quickly realized it was not. I then thought my dad had gotten up, which is pretty common for him. So I asked my mom, not realizing she was falling asleep, if my dad had come down and if it was him. She sleepily said yes, so I try to brush it off again. Suddenly I see this thing flying at me and landing on the floor in front of me. I thought, that can't be the cat's. I got up and walked over to the hallway. I got to the step when I realized that my dad's walking stick and straw hat that was on top of our coat hanger were on the floor. I walked up the step and heard movement in the office. It was dark. The office is right next to the front door, about two meters from the living room front door. I thought it might be my sister looking for something. And then, this guy gets up, comes out of the room, goes to the front door, unlocks it, and then walks out. He was wearing a hoodie and I didn't see his face. I was paralyzed with fear and confusion. My mind immediately went to, do I know him? After he left, I yelled out to my mom that someone had just walked out. She was obviously confused and concerned. We realized he came in from the back door, which was unlocked. He either climbed the gate, which is about two meters high, I think, or walked up the neighbor's stairs and then over the wall. The only things he took were the back door keys and a Bluetooth player, we believe. We don't really care about that. We made a barricade that would make noise if he came back, and we sat with knives and a big two-tooth fork until about 5 a.m. We had another lock, so my dad changed it the next day. I slept with a knife under my bed that night. Looking back, I wish I had done something. I played rugby for two years. I know the basics to tackle, but I couldn't move. Obviously because of fear, but my brain was also trying to understand what was happening. I probably could have taken him on. He was very thin and looked to be between 17 and 20 at most, judging by his style and body. We think we might know who did it, but they didn't break in. They only took two things and walked past all of our valuables. He didn't do anything to us. It almost looked like he was trying to get my attention as well, almost as if it was a bet and he tried to find a reason to get out. Either that, or he's the worst robber I've heard of. I'm just happy my sister was in bed. It probably would have been a different story if she'd been there with us. A lot of people think they know how they'd react in certain situations. I am living proof you don't. I thought I'd scream at least, but nothing. We now lock our doors every night. Every time I hear a noise, I get a bit frightened, but I'm okay. If he wanted to hurt me, he would have tried. We got lucky. First off, I'm a 22-year-old male. I'm a bit stocky and muscular, but not fat. I'm not somebody you would try to actively avoid in a dark alley, but also not someone you would really want to pick on for being puny. I'm a pretty average guy. Anyway, before this starts to sound like your typical dating profile, let me begin. I was with my girlfriend, and it was around 10 p.m. It was dark out. We left a friend's house to meet some other friends at an Applebee's about 20 minutes away. We pulled out of the driveway and started driving. About three minutes down the road, I noticed a large truck following us very closely. It swerved a bit, but the driver didn't seem drunk. The speed limit was 45 miles per hour, and I was going a solid 50. It was a fairly straight road, and not many cars were on it. The driver started flashing his lights. This is normally a pretty universal sign that either my lights are off, he wants me to pull over, or I'm not driving adequately. 
I recently had my car inspected and passed, so it wasn't the lights. I was driving just over the speed limit, and there was no way that I was pulling over. Plus, it was a passing lane, so he could have passed if he wanted to. I kept driving. He was literally right behind me, not 15 or 20 feet, but right behind me. There were no other cars around, so I decided to start taking side roads. I knew the area pretty well, so I was confident. Meanwhile, my girlfriend just really wanted Applebee's, classic girlfriend. So I took some random side road, and of course, he followed right behind me, still flashing his lights. I kept turning into other roads, trying to lose him, but he was staying right on my trail. Finally, my girlfriend realized how weird this was and began getting a little nervous. I have to admit, I was nervous too. Our area has some high crime rates and some gang initiations involving running people off the road, forcing people to pull over and shoot them, and other car-related mumbo-jumbo. So we were both scared that this could be the case. I kept taking side roads, and he kept staying right behind me. Finally, we arrived at a Walmart. This Walmart has a back road where the trucks go to unload. I took the turn onto this road without even using my blinker, still trying to lose it. I ended up driving up to 80 miles per hour on the small back road, but this person would not stop. The small road wraps around to the main parking lot. I skipped all the stop signs and ignored all safety rules of the road. Thanks to the fluorescent Walmart lights, I was able to see that the truck was red and beaten down. I could see Applebee's in the distance, so I decided I would park and just deal with this like a man. At this point, my girlfriend was actually tearing up. This whole ordeal may not sound that scary, but trust me, it was. Once we pulled into the Applebee's parking lot, I noticed that the red truck was no longer following us. He just disappeared. I looked at my girlfriend for four seconds to comfort her, and when I looked up, the truck was gone. This was honestly terrifying. I pulled up to Applebee's to meet my friends inside, and they could tell we were visibly shaken up. We were so shaken up that we didn't even get any food to eat, even though we were really hungry. I managed to glance out the window and noticed the same red truck parked three or four rows behind our car, just sitting there with the lights on. I'd had enough. I grabbed a steak knife from the table and went outside to find out what was going on. When I got to the truck, nobody was inside. The back seat was full of duct tape, random tools, tar, and other everyday items that seem especially creepy at the time. I took pictures of the license plate and waited around for the owner to return, but he didn't. There's no doubt he saw me waiting by his truck, sweatshirt hood up, looking like a weirdo. I called the police, let them know what was happening, and left it at that. I was told to be very careful, as gang initiations were starting to pick up speed in our area. The truck was the same one that followed me around. And yes, it could have just been some teens trying to be funny, but don't mess with me, my girlfriend, or Applebee's. So, Mr. Truck Driver who ruins appetites, and may want to kill me, let's not meet. First, a bit of context as to where, when, and how this occurred. I was in rural New Brunswick, Canada, at my grandparents' home. They'd both recently passed away, and my family was there to help clean up the house. It's located near the end of a dirt road that ends in a little lake, so there's rarely any traffic down the road, except occasionally during the day, when people come to kayak or swim in the lake, or things like that. The house has no running water because the pipes froze during the winter when nobody was there. But there is a little building, about 200 to 300 meters by the lake, that has public bathrooms and showers. It's unlocked 24-7, so we've been using this facility as our place to shower and use the toilet. 
So it's about 12.10 a.m. on a Monday morning, and after a week of avoiding the gross bathrooms, I was just like, fuck it. I want to go take a shower and clean up before I go to bed. So I grab a towel and a flashlight and start walking down there. Now, keep in mind, without a flashlight, it's absolutely pitch black and you cannot see anything which means that anybody who has a light is very visible from basically all sides. At this point, everything was pretty chill and I was just enjoying the peaceful walk, when suddenly, toward the end of the road, I hear a car's engine start and lights flick on. Immediately, I'm like, what the fuck? Why are there people down there at this hour? You rarely see anybody parking down there even during the day. I'm already a bit creeped out. The car does a three-point turn and starts coming up the road toward me. It's an older model Chrysler 300 that looks beat up as fuck. I've also never seen this vehicle out here before, which is weird because this is the kind of place that only locals use, so you do get to know the cars around here. It's pitch black and I can't see inside the car. It drives past me really slow. I breathe a sigh of relief as it starts to leave toward the main road. At this point, I'm almost at the dirt path where the bathrooms are, and I can see the light from the building. That's when I turn around, and the car's doing another three-point turn, coming back toward me. I'm freaking out, thinking what is going on. So I turn off my flashlight and just run toward the bathroom area as the car's making its way back. I duck in behind the storage shed for hiding. The car passes the bathroom, but immediately stops and turns around again. And then everything goes silent, and the lights turn off. I was tempted to go into the building and do my bathroom business, but they would have seen me walking into the light. I felt unsafe coming out of the bathroom if I didn't know who was out there. I hear some doors opening and closing on the car, and I thought I heard the sound of a voice, but it was faint. I saw the light from a headlamp or flashlight over by the car, and I hear some walking around. I was so terrified. I thought I was going to get kidnapped or something, because I'm alone, in the middle of nowhere, with some weirdo in a beat-up car. I wanted to run back towards the house, but I couldn't, because their car was right in front of my hiding spot. I couldn't go that way. After about 25 minutes of sitting there, I stopped hearing the noises, but the car was still there. I decided to bushwhack through the forest to cut back to the house and avoid the car. So I safely made it back to the house and never saw that car again. My conclusion is that maybe they were doing something illegal and they saw me coming with my flashlight, so they got out of there because they thought I was a cop coming to investigate. And they saw it was just some random kid, and decided to come back and keep doing whatever illegal thing they were doing. It seems like the most likely explanation, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. I'm an average looking female in my early 20s. I've always been the more cautious type, especially after moving to a large city from a small town in the Midwest and investing hours into true crime and missing person cases. My friends tell me I'm paranoid, but I'd rather be paranoid than dead. Anyway, the building I work out of sort of shares a parking lot with the Staybridge Inn Hotel. The parking lots are separated by a little island of gravel that's probably five foot wide. Then, Caddy corner to my office building, but not very close, is a different hotel. Days in. I should also mention that these buildings are right off the interstate, so they tend to be busy with travelers and truck drivers. The Staybridge Inn just finished renovating and had a shit ton of random hotel furniture chilling out by the dumpsters in the Staybridge parking lot, which were conveniently right in front of where I had parked. With the time change, it now gets dark at around 5, but this night I had to stay behind an hour to talk with a client on the phone before having to head up north for a fundraiser. After the phone call, I went out to my car, 
but I noticed two men standing and smoking in the hotel parking lot, pretty close to the dumpsters. Nothing too out of the ordinary. I got in my car and locked the doors, of course. As I was looking up the address of the fundraiser, a lady seems to come out of nowhere and taps on my window. I crack it a bit and she just seemed off. She kept looking around and asking me what the building I work in is. I told her what it's for. She said, do you work here? I said sometimes. Then she asked me what all the furniture in the parking lot is for. And I told her that I think the hotel just renovated and updated their furniture. Then, she asked me if I was going to take any of it. I told her no. She was so adamant about me taking some of it, asking me multiple times if I wanted anything or if I wanted help loading a couple of nightstands into my car. No. A desk? No thanks. How about that dresser? No. Are you sure you don't want anything? It's all in really good shape. No thanks. Keep in mind, I drive a small SUV. There was no way a desk or a dresser would fit, and I'm sure any sensible person would look at my car and make that connection. At this point, I had a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, because she said almost frantically, Okay, well I'm staying over there, pointing at the day's end. If I gave you five dollars, could you help me carry some of the furniture over there? The day's inn is not a couple of minutes walk away. It would take at least ten minutes to walk there, let alone carrying heavy furniture. Red flags were going off everywhere, so I just apologized and told her I had somewhere to be. I rolled my window up and left. It just really seemed like she was trying to lure me out of the car, and her frantic behavior and persistence made it even weirder. Maybe she was just a nice lady asking for help, but if she wanted it that bad, why didn't she drive her car over to load the furniture into it? I don't know. Like I said, I'd rather be paranoid than dead. I used to work at a small neighborhood gas station. I was working an open shift at 6am with my best friend and co-worker. We were doing our normal opening stuff, and as the sun came up, I went to get some ice from the back. For reference, the gas station building used to have a drive through so we have that kind of window in the back. I glanced at that back window, and realized there was a literal bloody handprint on it. I looked closer, and there were smudges of blood around the window handle that looked like someone was definitely attempting to slide it open. We were really freaked out, so we went around to look for other potential entrances into the building. I looked at the window in the front and noticed dried blood on the hole where we take money for gas from the outside. It was kind of like someone was trying to stick their hand in to get something inside. I kept looking around and there was also dried blood on the front door handles and also some splatters on the glass, like someone was pounding on it. My friend and I were both freaking out at this point. So, luckily I had access to the security cameras. I checked them for any motion detected during the night. At 5am, there was a motion capture, and we watched as a man with his arms covered in blood walked around the store, trying to get in. The freakiest thing was that usually the store opened at 5am, but it happened to be a Sunday, so we opened at 6. I really dodged a bullet there. There were police lights in the distance on the cameras, so we called the sheriff. He showed up pretty quick, watched the security footage, and confirmed it was the guy they picked up just a bit after 5.30. It's the craziest thing to happen to me in my three and a half years of working at gas stations. My now husband and I moved in together almost four years ago to a rather nice, albeit expensive, apartment complex in a sort of nice part of town. We are on the third floor with a large balcony that overlooks out onto the courtyard in which other apartments in the complex are located. Basically, 
You can see the other balconies and living rooms of the other tenants and the open stairwells. A year went by without a hitch. My husband works at a bar so he comes home late while I usually make it home around 5. It is easy to get to any apartment doorway as the complex is large and open with no security doors except the door to the apartment. It started in August of 2016. I would be home after work chilling and watching TV. Almost always around 9.30, I could hear someone come up the stairs. Things would be all quiet, and all of a sudden, loud, sharp knocks on my door. I did not move because it was startling, but eventually, I went to look through the peephole. Through it, I saw three people, all with black hoodies on, all seemingly staring at the peephole like they could see me. I did not answer the door and after a while, they left. Cue to a few weeks later. The same time, but this incident, there were footsteps, and then loud hard bangs on the door that sent my cat flying to hide. I sat, frozen, but I said to myself, maybe it's the police. I made it to the people once again, this time staring out at one person. It was a man. He had on a dark hoodie, and he was very, very gaunt. He had huge black eyes. Again, I did not answer the door and grab the kitchen knife that I kept by my side until my husband came home. This continued for weeks and once when my husband was home. He proceeded to look out the people, saw the man, and screamed for him to leave. And he did. We called maintenance and the police who both stated that they would do regular patrols, but nothing else, and they suggested cameras. Everything stopped for a while, maybe six months during the winter, which helped me be at ease, because when all of this was happening, I was having a very hard time sleeping and stopped going out at night. However, I assumed the same man started up again, except this time, the same large bangs on the door would happen, but when I would look out of the peephole, no one was there. I then became horrified as I started to notice extinguished cigarette butts by the side of my door. It was like someone was standing and waiting. Again, I reported it. Security stepped up in the area, but I still didn't feel safe. I was hoping it would just stop as I felt tortured in my own home, but as I realized two weeks ago, things could be much worse. At night, to go to bed I would have to cross our eating area, which was right in front of our giant glass sliding door that led out to our balcony. It was a late night, lights off in the apartment. As I walk by, I glance over, and across the courtyard, I see the same man standing on the landing of the stairs across the way from the second to third floor, staring right at my balcony. He was just standing there unmoved, facing in my direction. The same man at my door. I went numb, heart racing, chilled to the bone. I know he couldn't have seen me because the lights were off and the stairway had lights of its own, but I was still scared shitless. I called my husband who rushed over, but the man had left. I did more reports to the front office more promised security patrols. This same creepy dead-eyed man in the black hoodie continued to stand at the stairway landing, staring at my apartment. It has now been two weeks and he does this every Friday. I am horrified and I've been having awful nightmares about someone breaking in and strangling me in my sleep. I live in a very rural area somewhere in Europe. I used to go to the forest pretty often on my bike, by walking, or in my car. I would commonly go there all alone to collect rocks and take pictures, or play around with fire. One day, in a really warm summer, as I was driving through the forest, I would park nearby a giant rock, and I began walking on this really stretched path. As I was walking, 
I would hear what sounded like a hissing sound coming from my right side, pretty close to me. I thought it was a fox. I turned to my right and I saw a weird figure doing what seemed like abstract movements. I couldn't notice the form of this figure at all because of all the trees and leaves covering my vision, so I would slowly move forward. And at this point, it was starting to take form. It was this thing with a creamy-like skin. As I'm moving, I immediately notice that this figure is actually a completely naked guy doing odd movements with his arms. He was on a blue carpet and wearing a brown hat backwards. I recall there was a backpack on his side. To this day, I still think he was doing yoga, and I just didn't know what it actually was. I think he somehow noticed me looking at him, even when he was not looking at me, because he just randomly took his stuff and began running to my left. I ran to my car and went home, and I wouldn't be able to sleep that night. To this day, I still think about it. It was incredibly scary to me. Today, on my morning commute, something caught my eye in the brush beside the road. I immediately ID'd it as a deer, either an adolescent or a baby. I slowed my car down just in case it decided to dart out onto the road. As my car slowed, I realized something was very wrong. The deer was frozen in place, cheeks stained with streaks of dried blood from its wide open eyes. Flies were swarming around and I realized it was dead. When I got to work, I googled deer diseases and couldn't find anything that would cause one to die standing up, and unless it happened post-mortem, I have no explanation for the tears of blood. The more I think about this, the more certain I become that someone found the poor thing dead and decided to pose it right there on the side of the road. Why anyone would ever decide to do this is beyond me. Nothing like a bit of mild life scarring on the way to work, I guess. When I was around 11 or 12, I would hang out at the park across the street from my house with friends. It's not a really popular park or anything more just the neighborhood slash side streets nearby, but it is a proper playground. A friend and I were there more towards the evening, about 4 or 5 p.m. We were sitting at the top of the playground, looking up at the sky. We hear someone walking on the path nearby and turn to look. There's this decent height, thin guy, in a hoodie walking our way. Mind you, we're now the only three people in the park. We stay there because we figure, ah, the guy must be walking the path through the park, past the playground and out to the other end. No, the guy comes off the path and starts walking across the wood chips over to the playground. At that point, we get up, kind of chuckle, and shift around nervously. He starts climbing the stairs, dead-ass eye contact the entire time. This is where we were really nervous. Us being at the top of the playground, we go down the slide, start walking around the side, back to the bottom, to see if this guy is actually following us. Or maybe it's just some dude wanting the playground. The guy goes up, comes down, and walks around the side. We took the longest way around, weaved a bit. This guy does the exact same. At this point, he seems to be speeding up to catch up to us. My friend and I look at each other and we just book it the fuck out of there. The guy starts running after us until he sees we're running to a house. He immediately turns around and beelines it out of the park from where he came. This is probably the closest I've ever been to someone potentially trying to kidnap me, or someone with me. Thank God this park is close to houses.
So first, a disclaimer. This is not safe for work for a reason. It has some language and some events that are a bit, uh, well, let's just say this isn't a story I would tell in church. Also, as this involves hitchhiking, I realize that someone out there will surely say, well, hitchhiking is dangerous. I am fully aware of this, as you will soon find out. So now that's out of the way, on to the story. It was around 2004. I decided I'd had enough of the bitter, cold, rocky mountain winters. I'd spent most of my time since I was around 16, listening almost exclusively to Jimmy Buffett music except for small breaks to listen to things like Journey's Greatest Hits. He was pretty much my entire musical life. I would listen to him talk about these far-off places and these great adventures and weird characters that he'd come across. I read his books, which talked about pretty much the same thing. I read interviews where, you guessed it, he talked about pretty much the same thing. So my young, 22-year-old brain was filled with these ideas that adventure was out there waiting for me, that all I had to do was go and find it. Why was I rotting away in a frozen hell when there was so much more to see in the more tropical climates? And it is this thinking that led me to pack everything I owned and stick my thumb out on the interstate. I was headed for Mobile, Alabama, which is Jimmy's hometown. Then I was headed for Florida, where most of his songs are based. There, well, the possibilities seemed endless. Maybe find some work on a boat in exchange for passage to some place like Jamaica. You can go ahead and laugh at me. It's been around 17 years, so wisdom and life experience has allowed me to see clearly how stupid I was for all of this. I can take the ribbing. I've been getting grief over it for the better part of two decades. More on that later. My journey took me through Texas and Arkansas. There are many funny stories along this journey, like the time I was picked up in a desert by an old guy named Buddy in a hippie van. However, these stories are not the focus here, because they aren't creepy. Along the way, I also passed through Falk, Arkansas, and learned about the Falk monster. Fascinating little bit of folklore. So anyway, my journey took me down to South Louisiana, an interstate town. When you head down the section of highway between Lafayette and Baton Rouge, you have to pass over a Chafalaya Basin, which means crossing over 18 miles of swampland via bridge. According to Wikipedia, this bridge is the third longest in the US, second longest in the United States interstate system, and 14th longest in the world. That's a lot of bridge, and the shoulder, virtually non-existent. From what I've been told, Police are quick enough to nab anyone foolish enough to try crossing this bridge on foot. So I was stuck for hours on the Lafayette side of the bridge, attempting to thumb a ride across. Eventually, I was successful, and this is where things take an unsettling turn. A white van pulled up. When the door opens, there was no one in the vehicle but an old man. He looked to be in his late 60s or early 70s, quite obese and wearing nothing but a pair of shorts. I climbed in and thanked him for stopping. As we took off, When the Sun Goes Down by Kenny Chesney and Uncle Cracker was playing on the radio. Due to the events that followed, I have forever lost any liking I had for that song. We were headed across this massive bridge with nowhere to stop and nowhere for me to go. The man started looking at me like a dog might look at a particularly meaty bone. It was making me uneasy already. Hey boy, he said in a thick Cajun accent. How big are you packing? Excuse me? I asked. I looked back at him, then out the window of the moving vehicle. There was no escape route. I bet it's pretty big, he said, smiling at me. I really don't want to discuss this. I said. Nothing but guardrail on the right and swampland below that. Jumping out would be deadly. He proceeds to question me and ask to see it. No, I don't think so, I replied. What I was thinking was, you can wish in one hand and shit in the other and see which one fills up first. Undeterred, the man went on. 
I'd sure like to take you into the swamp. Oh hell, if I once thought that this situation couldn't get any worse, I would have been so, so incredibly mistaken. No, I don't think so, I repeated. Oh, come on, boy, he insisted. It'll only take us about 30 minutes. Please understand that I'm making his English clearer for those reading, but it was thick Cajun, as I've said before. The way he was saying it made it way creepier. At this point, the man had asked me to expose myself and expressed his desire to take me into the swamps. I couldn't help but wonder if he was going to give me a choice or if he was just going to take me there by force. If he did, I would be virtually helpless. I wasn't from there. I didn't know the area. I certainly didn't know the layout of the swamps. I would have been at his mercy, and whatever it was that was pleased took a lot of forms in my mind. Would he take me somewhere, do whatever he wanted with me, and then feed me to the gators? Would he hold me prisoner and torture me before killing me and feeding me to the gators? Or would he just kill me immediately and feed me to the gators? For some reason, every scenario involved alligators. I don't want to go into the swamp with you, no. I said as firmly as my overwhelming fear would allow. As I'm here telling this today, it goes without saying that I did not end up as gator bait. He didn't take me forcefully into the swamps. He didn't do anything to me physically. Psychologically, however, his terrifying comments were torture as the bridge went on and on and on for what seemed like forever. When we finally reached the other side and he let me out, I thanked him for the ride as politely as I could manage. When he pulled away, I could have fallen down and kissed the ground. I was safe. I was not dead. My journey continued for several days until I ultimately ended up in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. There was another incident before I got there when I was picked up in Walker, Louisiana by a man who wasn't so much creepy as he was potentially dangerous. By the time I ran into him, I was physically exhausted and dirty, and I hadn't had decent rest in days. When he and his wife offered to let me stay in their guest room for the night, I was so grateful to not have to sleep in the woods or in a ditch along the side of the road or in the back booth of some diner that I took them up on it. Desperation and exhaustion will cloud a person's thinking. As we pulled away, he said, in a genuinely friendly tone, that I was welcome at his home and that he wasn't dangerous. I genuinely believed him until he pulled out a gun from between the seats and warned me that I better not be dangerous either. Oh boy. So why did I still go with him? Exhaustion and desperation, like I said. So, I'm in the guest room of his trailer, in a comfortable bed for the first time, and I'm pretty sure it was a couple of weeks. I'm relaxing there when his sister comes over. I don't see them being in a bedroom, but I hear them in the living room. She's suicidal and wanting to die. That's all she keeps talking about. Wanting to die and wanting to end it all. Finally, I hear the man get fed up and snap. You want to die, he screams. You want to die. And then, I hear a gunshot. Oh my god. There are several seconds there where I'm again terrified of what's about to happen to me. This man just shot his sister, and I'm here in the house with him, a potential witness. I look up at the window, wondering if I can fit through it and escape. I cannot. Then I hear her speak up. You shot a hole in the ceiling. So apparently, he hadn't shot his sister. He was just a trigger-happy lunatic who had shot around into the ceiling to emphasize his frustration. To be fair, they were actually very nice people. After the commotion, I ended up staying overnight anyway. His wife took me back to the interstate in the morning. We had a nice conversation along the way, but I wouldn't stay there again. Ever. It's a one-star rating. But my hosts were very polite. When I got to Bay St. Louis, I ended up getting picked up by a lady who lived in Mobile, Alabama, who ended up taking me in, and she's my foster mother to this day. 
or a lover to death. This horrific trip ended with me finding a new life and a new family, so there is a silver lining to every dark cloud, I suppose. Her husband, who is my foster father, has never stopped giving me grief about any of this. In almost 20 years, he's never tired of it. He especially liked to rip on Jimmy Buffett, an artist he despises, and he refers to him as Jimmy Buttplug. Did I learn anything from this? Well, if you're asking if I learned not to hitchhike, no. I went on several more journeys over the years before I'd finally decided that I'd had enough adventure. Someone will surely think I'm stupid for this. Young people tend to be stupid, so no argument there. If you need any further proof of this, watch MTV's coverage of Spring Break sometime. Watch how dumb those young people act as they party on the beach. As a word of advice to those who might be considering hitchhiking, just don't. You can meet a lot of really interesting people. You can have a lot of positive experiences, but you can also end up getting picked up by a maniac. And you might not be as lucky as I was. I was on a hitchhiking adventure from British Columbia, Canada to Antigua, Guatemala, which started in September 2019. If you've ever hitchhiked before, you know how amazing it is and how many cool people you can meet. Out of the thousands of rides across 40 countries, I've only had two bad or dangerous encounters thumbing it. This was my second one. I was taking a break from traveling to find weed trim work in California's Nevada City, a beautiful little town with a very interesting crowd, but I got stuck a few towns over for not getting a ride all day. I ended up sleeping at night at the Love's gas station, which I'd done plenty of times before. In the morning, I was a little more desperate to accept rides because no one was stopping and it had already been a whole day. I just wanted to get out of there. A pickup truck is speeding past me and slams the brakes ahead, then slowly backs up. Inside is a man and a woman in their late fifties, and he says in a husky voice, Where are you headed, boy? Nevada City, any distance helps. Well, get in. We're going to Yuba. They seemed normal enough, even without most of their teeth and hair, so I jumped in. It all happened in rapid succession. I toss my bag in the back and jump in. I shut the door. I notice a pile of guns and bullets on the floor. And before I have time to rethink my decision, we speed off. So as I'm trying to assess whether or not I'm in danger, they start telling me how this guy just got out of jail for aggravated assault. How he beat that motherfucker so bad he can't think straight no more. And they both laugh. She's holding his seatbelt over his chest, and they both smell like shit. They start asking how much money I have. I start thinking to myself, yeah, I'm not safe here. After hitchhiking all this way, I don't look particularly wealthy. I'm filthy. I need a shower. I look no different than the stereotypical homeless guy, so I try to seem more poor than I am, and more tough than I am, too. I'm broke as fuck, man. That's why I'm going to the city. I'm hoping to make some cash trimming. The man looks me in the eye. Well, you'll find it all right. You'll find it good. Don't be afraid to do no dirty work. If people try, and they'll try, to fuck you, you fuck them first. You get what I'm saying? Put your eyes on the damn road. Jesus Christ. The woman points forward, and he swerves back to the right lane. He asks me if I smoke. And knowing that California has legalized weed, I put two and two together. He's offering me a joint, so I say, Yeah, I smoke. With a wild look in his eyes, he exclaims, Great, and we turn off the highway and start down a dirt road. I'm more than worried, and I look behind us. In the back of the truck is my bag, a chainsaw, pickaxe, and a plastic tarp over something. That didn't help my anxiety. Finally, we stop in front of a clearing. The woman takes out, not a joint, 
but a meth pie. It's the first time I've seen a meth pie, and a lot of things start to make sense. While he lights up and exhales into the car, I roll the windows down as fast as possible because I don't want to smoke that shit. The woman takes some as well, and they tell me how they were going to collect money that a woman owes them. That damn bitch is going to pay today, one way or another. Damn straight, she better have the money. I'm going to grab her and say, where's my money, bitch? Oh, she'll have it all right. She'll have it or else. Say, son, you ever steal something? Because we could make $20,000 today. I don't know exactly how to answer this guy. And he repeats, $20,000 today. Here, smoke some of this. And he hands me the pipe. Nothing like meth. Ain't that right? I gently reject it and say that meth's not really my thing, which he surprisingly takes well and smokes some more before putting it away and driving off back towards the highway. His driving is terrible. Swerving, speeding, hitting the brakes abruptly, and starts trying to convince me to help them steal marijuana plants. You'll hold my gun, and I'll drill the hole, and I'll keep a lookout. Yeah, baby girl will keep a look. Now you gotta be careful if you hear the dogs, because them sons of bitches are nasty. See this bite? And he reveals what looks like a terrible scar on his arm. I don't really know how to get out of the situation, so I sounded as confident as possible and said that I was meeting a friend to look for work together and that they would be expecting me today. We neared the end of Yuba City when they pulled over the side. Well, it's your funeral. You don't want to eat, fine by me. But if you ever want the cash, you can call me. He then hands me his number. Hell no, I think. Thanks, I will. I quickly retrieve my bag, smiling nervously. The woman says with a wave, Take care now. God bless. And they speed off. I'm standing on the side of the road thinking, What the hell was that? I was just happy to be out of that car. At the age of 18 to 19, I used to pick up hitchhikers and go hitchhiking myself. The 1990s felt a bit different to now. One day I was traveling from Edinburgh to back home. It was about 70 miles. I saw a fella hitchhiking a ride just outside of Edinburgh city limits with a sign saying north. He seemed to have loads of stuff. Most went in a trunk, some in the back seat. He jumped in the front and off we went. He seemed quite awkward, and his accent was all over the place. German, French, English. It felt forced, though. Small talk was difficult. He looked punk or alternative, and so we will have music in common. Let's talk about music, I thought. He was wearing an exploited t-shirt, which is a local band. I asked if he saw them while in Edinburgh, as they played two days before. He said he hadn't heard of them. Okay, I thought. The more we talked, the more uneasy I felt, and the more he seemed to relax. He had a bunch of piercings which he started talking about, and said he'd done them himself. They looked it. Each one was squint and looked brand new. He started telling me about how he'd been spending the last year or so, which sounded somewhat off-grid in terms of living. He'd been traveling around Europe on a motorcycle he'd built himself. Fair enough. I worked as a mechanic at that point in life, so I asked about the setup. He got irritated and changed the conversation. He then got onto how a monk had found him half dead in a field and nursed him back to hell. He then worked at the monastery to repay his debt. It sounded like something out of a movie. This bizarre story lasted 30 or so minutes. Through the monastery story, he kept saying there's no need to pull that face and getting quite aggressive. I mentioned it doesn't really make sense as you've jumped around four countries and I'm also driving and trying to listen to a German accent. He then freaks out and starts smashing his fists on the dashboard, screaming how he wants out. Fair play, we are almost there. As soon as I slow down to a give way sign, he jumps out of the car, 
flings the doors open, grabs his stuff, and walks off, leaving the doors open. I get out to close the doors and say sorry to the people behind me who had to wait and witness this. I look over to see where he's going, and he was climbing a fence and heading into a farmer's field. I was a little freaked out and just wanted to get home. The minute I'm through the door, my mom knows there's something wrong, and I tell her the story. She suggests I check the car in case he stole anything and phone the police. Yeah, he forgot some bags. Great. I phoned the police and left details. I forgot about it for a couple of days or so, and then I wake up to my car window smashed and the bags gone. It was a heart sinking moment. I phoned the police again, and this time they turned up and take a statement. I dropped him about 12 miles from where my parents lived so I wrote it off as a coincidence. Six months later, I see a Crime Watch episode where they have the Have You Seen This Person section. Guess who it was looking like a suit? Wanted across Europe for very bad things. Entered the UK under false documents. Thought to have changed his appearance. And attacked people in a car after they picked him up hitchhiking. That was the second heart-sinking moment. Apparently, the punk rock look was a disguise. I've never picked up a hitchhiker since. Myself and my buddy Todd are driving through a town we live in. It's in Iowa. It was 12 or so at night and we were smoking lots of weed. He's only 15, and I'm 19 at this point. The reason he was driving is because I'm quadriplegic and I can't drive myself. The subwoofer I installed was pounding. In fact, we were so tuned into the music that we didn't notice that the streetlights are suddenly not working where we're driving. My buddy looks back at me and asks for a song. I look up to ask what he's saying, just in time to see a man lit up like a deer in headlights. He wasn't normal. He had on khakis and looked like a presentable older man with blonde hair. Here's the creepy part. His thumb was straight out to his side like he was hitchhiking, and he had an ungodly grin that shouldn't be possible. We swerved all the way from the right lane across to the middle lane, then into the left in a matter of seconds, and we somehow managed to not scratch my vehicle. We both look back and I tell Todd to get us gone. We never saw anything on the news, and I even alerted the police. The creepiest thing was, he looked like an aged version of a mutual friend between us. This was only a few months ago, but I swear I still see things sometimes. Okay. So let me take you back to a weird encounter I had with this hitchhiker. It was midwinter last year. My brother and I were going to our grandparents' house. The road we took was pretty scenic, and it isn't the usual road people take to go where we're going, since there's easier and faster ways. As we drove past a certain road, there was this guy wearing really busted looking flannel, jeans, shoes, and a cap. At first we just thought he was going to get picked up by someone, since hitchhikers aren't a big thing from where I'm from. Anyway, my brother looks at me and says, You reckon we should help him? Me, being the crime junkie I am, shook my head and said, Nah, he's probably waiting for someone specific. We arrived to my grandparents and have a good time there. The time we left was probably around 10pm and it was pretty dark already. My brother took the same way back, as we just liked the views and longer drives. He was trying to be funny and drive really fast. As he did, we literally zoomed past the same man. I told him to go back since it's been like three or four hours since we last saw him. My brother hesitated at first, but then did a U-turn. When we got back to the guy, we asked if he wanted a ride and he says yeah. He told us where he wanted to go, and we said sure. Why not? We're gonna go past there anyway. When he got into the back seat, the first thing we noticed was the smell. He reeked. Then, when I offered him a water bottle, he took it. 
He didn't look homeless or anything, so I didn't suspect that he was. But I did notice he had a hell of a lot of scratches on his arms. I brushed it off and just kept looking at the road. The drive was silent. When we arrived where he said to go, he hopped out of the car. My brother decided to wait until he went into the house. When we waited, the guy looked back and just stood there. I got a bit uneasy and told my brother to just drive off. He ended up doing so, but I feel so guilty that maybe something bad had happened and it was our fault. So for the next three weeks, I kept checking for any news around that area, but nothing popped up. I even asked officers to do a wellness check there, but they couldn't, as I didn't actually know anyone there personally. So yeah. That was my little experience with a weird hitchhiker. When I was a kid, my parents weren't possibly strict. I was never given much opportunity to do things with my friends because my mother was confident that I'd end up doing drugs or having sex and whatever else her imagination could conjure up. The exception were a few Asian friends. My mother, a Thai woman, was inherently trusting of girls who were fully Asian and was less strict about my spending time with them. And so it happened that one day, Lin, a Chinese girl with two Chinese parents, invited me to the mall and my mother actually said yes. She even gave me 20 bucks for the bus, lunch, and maybe even a little something nice. Unfortunately, when I got to Lynn's house, she sadly announced that some family had showed up unexpectedly and she wouldn't be able to go. To describe my disappointment would be impossible. I was 14, and this was supposed to be the first real, without my parents' outing, I've ever embarked on. And here was Lynn, telling me it wasn't going to happen. As she went back inside, I walked away, trudging back towards my house. But as I walked, the idea hit me. Why not just go myself? I had the money. I could just get on the bus by myself and go to the mall. It started off staggeringly successful. I managed to catch the right bus, got to the mall and wandered around. I had my first real burrito experience, played games in the arcade, and bought leather goddesses of Phobos. I was having the time of my life. It was getting dark, so I decided it was time to head back home. I got on the bus, paid my fare, and told the driver where I was headed. The driver shook his head and informed me that he didn't go that far. What's more, I'd caught the last bus leaving the mall for the day, and that by the time he got me to the transfer station to catch the right bus, the buses would be done running. I put on a brave face and asked him how close he could get me. He described a spot about two miles from my house, so I agreed that it was fine. He dropped me off where we discussed, which happened to be outside a Dunkin' Donuts. Being that it was February, and that I was woefully underdressed for any significant amount of time outside, I went inside and bought myself a hot cocoa. Armed with my cocoa, I started the trek home. About a quarter mile into the walk, I approached an area that had always given me a little pause. It was just beyond the railroad tracks. In fact, it was the area my mind always conjured up when someone used the phrase, the wrong side of the tracks. There was even a strip club on the corner and a few rundown houses. I was determined to be brave though and continued on resolutely. Just as I crossed the tracks, an oncoming red econoline van slowed to a stop and the driver rolled down his window. He gave me a friendly smile and said, Hey, sweetheart, need a ride? Now, I may have been a dumb 14-year-old who hadn't had enough sense to realize that going to the mall alone in the first place was a bad idea, but I knew, with every fiber of my being, that taking a ride from strangers, and this particular stranger especially, was a very bad idea. I tried to smile casually and wait vaguely at a house nearby, Nah, I said. I just live over there. He looked back at the direction I was indicating, looked at me, and shrugged. All right, he said, but it's awfully cold out here. 
I just laughed and waved goodbye. He pulled away and drove off. Moments later, though, he drove by again, having apparently pulled a U-turn somewhere behind me. Just seeing this van again made my heart skip a beat, but he drove past me without slowing or even looking at me. He turned the corner ahead and I breathed a sigh of relief. As I rounded the corner, though, my heart dropped. He was parked in the strip club's parking lot, with his van pulled in backwards so that it faced the street, his parking lights on. I couldn't see through the windshield, but I tried to act like I hadn't even noticed him. I tried to act casual. I was already rounding the corner, but once I saw him, I tried to inconspicuously change routes and try to act like I was headed for the house across the street. I calmly walked around the back of the house, as if I maybe lived in the back, and I just stood there, trying to listen for signs of him driving away. I was terrified, however when I saw headlights lighting up the driveway that you see running alongside the house. And sure enough, he drove his van slowly into view. I was frozen in fear. He reached the end of the driveway and turned around, slowly heading up. I could see him looking in my direction, but I couldn't tell if he'd actually seen me or not. As soon as he started up the driveway again, I forced my legs into motion ran around the other side of the house and fled onto the porch and hid. I hid for what seemed like hours. I prayed someone would open the door and find me, but I was too afraid to actually knock on the door and ask for help. Eventually, half frozen and scared, and knowing that it was starting to get late and my mother was going to start wondering where I was, I peeked over the railing and scanned for any sign of him. I didn't see any, so I started running home. I still had over a mile and a half to go before I got home, and even at 14, I couldn't sustain a run very long, especially in my half-frozen condition. The walk seemed to take forever, and at every sign of a vehicle larger than a car, I would duck behind a tree or hide behind a bush. The entire time, I was mapping gateway routes. If he catches me up to here, where would I go? I can honestly say I've never been so terrified in my life. Less than a mile from home, I saw a large vehicle headed towards me that seemed to have the same headlights as an Econoline van. My heart just plummeted and I dove behind a bush. That I didn't piss myself when the driver slowed down is a wonder. I heard the window go down and amazingly, blissfully, I heard my mother's voice say, Julie? I stood up, and there she was, in our Ford Bronco, peering at me in confusion. I think I went from behind the bush to inside the car in a single bound. I can say that I caught some serious hell that night for lying, being stupid and everything, but hell never felt so good, because the entire time I could only think about what might have happened. This happened in my early 20s. It still makes my skin crawl to think of what might have happened to me. Around 10.30 on a summer evening, I was driving home from my boyfriend's house and stopped to grab something to eat from a fast food joint. I also ordered a hamburger patty for my dog, who was in the back seat of my car. The street I need to turn left on to go home is pretty busy, and there's no stoplight. While waiting, I'm eating some of my food with my window half down enjoying the nice weather. Then I hear someone say something to my left, and I see a group of four guys about a block away, walking in my direction down the sidewalk. Since my radio was on, I didn't hear what they said, and I stupidly turned it down and said, What? One of the guys in front says something, but again, I miss what he's saying. I glance back at the street and see a wall of traffic both ways, unable to turn, and consider turning right instead so I can just leave. The guy speaks again, and this time, I heard him. Hey, can we get a ride? Oh, no, I stammered out. This isn't good. They're about ten feet away from my car at this point, and I start rolling up my window while glancing between the guys in traffic. There's still no openings. My window almost up, 
maybe a couple of inches left, and I decided to back up into the parking lot and leave via an exit that led through a neighborhood. I put my car into reverse right as the guy who asked for a ride gets to my door. He sides up to the door, leans heavily against it, and asks again if he and his friends can get a ride. The way he was asking wasn't right, and his friends walked up pretty close by behind him. The next bit happened so fast, but felt like minutes went by. I took my foot off the brake to start reversing back into the parking lot because my brain was screaming at me to leave immediately. Rightly so, because as I say no and start to roll backwards, he tries to open my car door. I can still remember the thud sound of the handle snapping back down. Suddenly, my dog, who'd previously been enjoying his hamburger and oblivious to what was happening, jumped up and started throwing himself on the window and bouncing off of it, barking and snarling. The guy at my door puts his hands up and said, Oh, I didn't know you had a dog, as he and his friends quickly backed away. I floored it backwards with my heart in my throat. I didn't know my way through the neighborhood exit well, but I just kept driving and turning down streets until I figured out where I was. Once I got home and was safely in my garage with the door shut, I realized how much I was shaking. I have no idea what those guys wanted to do, but I'm very glad I did not find out. I'm so thankful my dog lost his shit and provided enough of a surprise and distraction for me to get out of there. I'm also thankful to my mom for teaching me to always keep my car doors locked. This is probably one of the things I look back on and want to bang my head and shout at myself for. So, about five or six years ago, I gave someone a ride. It was late, like really late, perhaps 2 or 3 a.m. I had just finished my gym workout. At that time, I really liked going to the gym when it was dead, so I could use the machines I needed to without waiting. I was walking back to my car when a guy approached me. He looked normal. He explained that his car broke down and he was waiting on a tow truck. He asked me if I could give him a ride to the gas station and it was about three miles away. I said yes. So, I unlock my car and motion him in. He directs me where to go. I make conversation while I'm driving, but get what I think at the time is mildly bizarre responses back. He makes a point to say his name several times. Admittedly, I've never been good with remembering names, even in passing, and I gave him my first name in return. After that, he starts saying his full name, which I just think is weird. I brush it off and keep driving, as the road we were on was one of the back roads without a lot of lights, so I'm quite focused. He asks me how I'm feeling and a question about how I like the city. I discuss my workout in response to that and I tell him what I like about the city. When I start telling him I like viewing the skyline at this time of night, he quickly agrees and says it's nice how people aren't really around at this time. I agree with him. The conversation tapers at that point, but I do notice that he's turned and looking at me still. He makes a point to say his name again, as if he hadn't previously introduced himself. Now, I pull into the gas station, and he kind of deflates. He gets out and roughly says thanks. That was it. Looking back though, there were several red flags. The gym I went to at the time was in a pretty isolated part, but if you were to break down, there was a gas station at the bottom of the hill it was on. You could see it from the gym and it was 24 hours like the gym. Surely, if you needed to wait somewhere else, you'd do so there, and not outside a gym you didn't go to. That brings up another thing. He'd made a point to say what kind of car he was driving. It was an expensive car, and if you're waiting on a tow, you have the option to wait with the car and drive with the tow driver. And also, I really wasn't paying attention at the time, but he directed me toward the road without any lights. There was another way to get to the gas station he wanted to go to, but he directed me elsewhere. 
There, the way he kept saying his name, like I should recognize either part of it, something about that never sat right with me. I can't even remember his name now, but that encounter is seared into my brain. There, when he got out of my car, he didn't even head inside the gas station. He just stood outside. He made no attempt to use a phone or anything. I'm older and not as trusting of people, but man, I know this was a stupid choice on my part, but I just wanted to help at the time. It must have been during our Christmas break. An old friend of mine was having a party. There was going to be alcohol and drugs. Of course I was going to be there. This friend lived in a town a few miles away. I was dropped off there with some other folks and expected to be staying there the whole night. But later on, I just decided I really wanted to sleep in my own bed. At this point it was getting really late in the night. Everyone else was already pretty fucked up. I knew the only way for me to get home would be to walk. I knew at the time it would be a long walk, about three miles. But I was pretty buzzed and pretty motivated to be somewhere comfortable. And I had my Zune on me so I decided to go for it. It was also December in central New York, so there was a pretty steady snowstorm bearing down that night. One important thing you should know is that when I was in high school, I was a big fella. About 5 foot 11 and roughly 330 pounds at the time, so obviously pretty hefty. I also didn't care too much about staying clean shaven, so I had a beard vaguely similar to Fidel Castro and actually dressed like him for Halloween a few years later, so I'm being pretty literal here. I also always wore basketball shorts no matter what the weather was like. Part of that was just being fat and hating jeans. The other part is the fact I've always just seemed to have a really high tolerance for cold weather. It just doesn't bother me that much. So I get about a mile into my walk, and at this point, it must be like nearly three in the morning, when this woman in her early thirties maybe, and driving by herself, pulls up alongside me. She claims to be concerned, which honestly I can understand. I really must have looked kind of crazy, and she insists over and over and over again that I let her give me a ride. I don't want a ride. I'm fine in the cold and I have my music, and I was really kind of enjoying the walk. I tell her I'm okay, but she absolutely refuses to take no for an answer. That's really the first thing that made me uncomfortable in that situation. Even being young at the time, I understood how I looked as a big guy with a big beard and a rough demeanor, walking down a county highway in the middle of the night. I honestly would have looked exactly like the sort of person you are taught to avoid, but she would not leave me alone. The way she kept insisting I got in her car just felt menacing in a way. The problem for me, though, was that even on this 40 mile per hour speed limit stretch, this woman decided that she would just follow me. Following just slightly behind me at my walking pace. Every so often she would pull up next to me and offer again a ride home. At one point I got fed up with it and decided I'll just take the ride. But as I'm walking towards the car, she tells me that I can't sit in front. I need to go in the back seat. Immediately I determined that's just bizarre. If this woman is so concerned and so willing to pick up a stranger as strange as me in the middle of the night, what makes me sitting in the back seat so essential? I have visions of child safety locks and being inexplicably kidnapped by a woman I outweigh by probably 200 pounds. So I decide I won't be getting in the car after all. She doesn't seem entirely happy with that. Actually, she calls the police. Some cops show up and she tries to convince them that I need a ride home. Cops determine that I'm old enough to make that call on my own and also probably realize what a strange thing that is for a stranger to be demanding. So the cops leave me to it. Nothing much else interesting happens except for the fact that this woman followed me for almost 40 minutes on my walk home. By the time I was close to my house, I was so freaked out by her that I cut through a few yards and actually went to my friend's place, where there was sort of an open door policy. 
to just wait for another hour or so until I was sure she was gone. There's just a lot about this experience that doesn't make sense to me. Why would a woman, all alone in the middle of the night, decide that she absolutely needed to get me, a big, crusty boy, in her car, but only the back seat? Where was she going at almost three in the morning, where she could take a near hour long detour to just follow me home? Why get the cops to try to literally make me accept her offer? None of that seems normal to me. And in the moment, it was truly terrifying. I was 19 at the time, and I was hitchhiking for no damn reason, other than wanting to do so. No, I was not traveling alone. I was traveling with my friend Randy. Randy and I were somewhere outside of San Francisco, thumbing our way to Oregon, so I could meet up with my really good childhood friend. This guy pulled up in a big red truck, and we put our packs in the back of his truck and climbed in the cab. He asks us where we're going, and we just say as far north as you're willing to take us. After a bit, he starts talking to me about how I look like I couldn't be more than 14, how I was really pretty. Naturally, as a female growing up where I did, I was kind of used to creepy comments like this, and never noticed how bad it genuinely was at the time, because it just seemed like normal bullshit. After a slew of compliments and suggestions of leaving Randy, and just going home with him, Randy finally had enough. He told him to just drop us off. He argued with Randy, saying he was just joking and making friendly conversation, but Randy was so insistent on having him drop us off. Randy asked me to grab the stuff out of the bed of the truck, and I hand him my stuff first, naturally. I go to hand him his bag, and the guy just starts driving to take off with me still on the back of his truck. I jump out, scared as fuck. We ended up losing a guitar because I never got to grab it out of the bed of his truck. I look back at it now, and while I had a lot of good memories out there hitchhiking, I still get so uncomfortable thinking about this one because I was just so close to being taken from my own negligence mostly. I'm a 29-year-old female, and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We're back in our hometown visiting family for about a week. It's a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere, and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area, Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach, and right away he's acting really weird. He was making jokes about us having a three-way. He kept on making a bunch of unwelcome, overly sexual, gross comments about us. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So me and my girlfriend are shooting each other panicked looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry, that he's never been like this before. We make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him that we want to get dinner at a local bar, but he asks to join us. We felt awkward, so we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he follows us. We get there, order drinks and food, and then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking weed on the patio and chilling. The food comes quick, and we finish it quicker. Now here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as we have had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signals that I want to go. She makes an excuse that we need to go. He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got good weeds and dabs there, and you can meet my cats, blah blah blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses that we need to go check on our grandpa and stuff like that. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight. We've parked next to each other. We walk up and get into our respective cars while saying goodbye. 
When we get into the car, my girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar but fake it like we were leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do and he says, my GPS is being funny. He asks if we can lead him to the main road. To be fair, we are in the middle of nowhere, so this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously staying behind at the bar was out. So in the car, we're talking about how pushy he was being. Then she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house. So we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we weren't sure what to do. So finally we get on a two-lane road, and he pulls up next to us, and he's waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for just a few seconds, then leaves in a hurry. Here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We know she had her phone, along with my phone and her weed. A few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave, she didn't take it back out. There is no way she could have left it at the bar. More importantly, he got it in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bar first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly saying goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now the kicker. Apparently, unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he'd been acting. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. So that's why he left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear. Number one, he stole my girlfriend's phone, and it seems like he did so so that we would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere. Number two, he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They've been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, what the fuck, why would you flash a knife at me? What is this, a bad movie? But instead, he just booked it, which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. And number three, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half of my drink and felt very tired. A few more things. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us knowing or noticing. It doesn't really make any sense. But he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We also have no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender, but we were the ones that suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy sexual comments probably tried to drug us, and he also stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road. This happened to me over 30 years ago, but I remember the feeling of fear as if it were yesterday. I was in college, I'm a female, and I'm taking a course in outdoor survival. The course ended with a three-day, three-night wilderness solo. We were allowed to take a backpack, empty canteen, sleeping bag, knife, six matches, rope, a sheet of plastic, a change of clothes, extra socks. Alizone tablets, small cooking spot, and a spoon. We were not allowed to bring food or water, 
since part of our training was in identifying edibles and finding a water source. Once I was dropped off, I had to hike in to find a spot to set up camp. First, I had to place a flag on a tree near my drop-off point so that I could be located three days later for pickup. I was loving life, just me and nature. I had no fears, even as night began to fall. I enjoyed the sounds of the woods all around me and didn't mind not having a tent. I built a small fire and had a great feeling of peace. I slept well that night, but woke up thirsty. My search for a water source began. Happily, I found a muddy stream, let the water settle in my pot, placed the tablets in the water, and boiled it for good measure. Yuck. What a shitty taste, but at least I was hydrated. All went well and I had a great time, until my last day. It was early afternoon on the last day, and time to break camp. I cleaned up my camp area and hiked out to my drop-off spot. As I sat, leaning against a tree, I heard the sound of a vehicle off in the distance. I figured that it had to be my pickup. As I waited, a vehicle that I'd never seen before pulled up on the dirt path in front of me. Immediately, I realized that I didn't know who the man was. He gave me an odd look. My gut told me that he was bad news. He asked what I was doing out there and if I was alone. I said that my friends were behind me, breaking camp. He gave me a knowing look, got back in his vehicle, and rode off. I was terrified. I knew that I had to hide, and fast. I ran into the woods and hid. As I ran, I heard the car come back. I stayed as quiet as I could and remained hidden. I heard him get out of the car. I could hear him calling to me and walking through the brush looking for me. I was so afraid. Eventually, he gave up and I heard the car door slam. The engine starts and the car pulled away. Going back to my drop-off point was not an option, so I began hiking through the woods, hoping I would find base camp. After walking for what felt like hours, I saw a forest ranger. I told him who I was and what had happened to me. He told me that I'd done the right thing, since a young woman had been assaulted the night before. The police and forest service had been searching the area. Happily, he drove me to the base camp where I learned that another girl in my class had a creepy encounter with a man the night before. She had scared him away by blowing a brass whistle until help arrived. If there's anything to be learned from this, it's being sure to always trust your gut feelings and never camp alone. This happened in May 2007, and for reference, I'm a female. I was 20 at the time and weighed about 115 pounds, so overpowering me would have been extremely easy. I live in the city in Northern Ireland, and at the time, I was best friends with my ex-boyfriend. My ex-boyfriend's cousin's band decided to play a small gig way out in the countryside, so we had to drive for about an hour or more to get to the location. We arrived, and it was literally a field amongst fields, smack back in the back ass of nowhere. Apparently, one of the members of the band knew the owner of this field, and apparently we had permission to be there. I never checked, so I don't know, but whatever. There were several cars already there when we arrived. We packed a car full of tents, sleeping bags, and a ton of alcohol. The plan was to watch the band, then blast some tunes, have a bit of a party, and spend the night in the field in our tents. The way the field was laid out was kind of an L shape. All the tents were set up around the corner, and the band had set up a generator across the field on the other side. Then, besides where the tents were, there was a hole in a bush to the other field. We went through here to go to the toilet so we had some privacy from everyone. There was roughly 30 to 40 people in the field, and the band started playing. 
We started drinking and generally having a good time. Any time I needed to pee, I went with my ex's sister or a friend as it was a good few minutes walk to the next field and none of us wanted to go alone, even though we were in the middle of nowhere. I was sharing my tent with my ex for the night and at about 3 a.m. I decided I'd had enough and wanted to go back to the tent to sleep. I told him I was going and made my journey across the field to the tents. As I got into the tent and pulled the zipper down, I felt someone tugging at it and assumed it was my ex, until I heard an unfamiliar voice say, Let me in, quite aggressively. I called out, Who are you? And he said, I know you're alone in there. You can't hold that zipper down forever. Let me in. Over the next minute or so, I was gripping on the zipper of the tent and holding both sides of the fabric together to prevent this guy from getting into my tent. A couple of times he managed to get the zipper up a bit, but I always managed to get it back down. For the life of me, I have no idea how I managed to do this. The whole time we were struggling against each other over the zipper, he kept saying things like, I'm gonna get in eventually, bitch. It's gonna be worse if you don't fucking let me in. I was absolutely petrified. Then I heard my ex-boyfriend's booming voice shout, What the fuck are you doing at that tent? Then I heard a smack and a thug, and my ex called to ask me if I was okay. My ex had saw what was happening, punched the guy, and he fell. He had watched me walk to the tents and watched this guy follow behind, assuming he was going to the bathroom, but he kept watching it to make sure. When he saw him turn towards the tents, he came over to make sure I was okay. Thank God he did. Anyway, a huge fight broke out, and then one of the creepy guy's friends ended up hitting him too. It turns out he was known for this kind of creepy behavior, and he'd been in trouble with the law for sexually harassing women in the past. My ex's cousin had said that he was staying at her house with her brother one night, and she woke up to find him standing in her room watching her sleep. I really don't know what his intentions were had he managed to fight his way into the tent that night. No one would have heard anything as the music was loud. But thank God my ex still cared enough about me to keep an eye on me as I made my way back to the tent that night. My ex actually bumped into the guy a few weeks later and told me that his lip was still pretty busted up and looked like he was going to have a permanent scar from the two punches. For a time, I worked at a rural hospital in Mississippi. I would often drive between my home state of Texas and Mississippi in the afternoon or evening. I've seen lots of weird and wacky things but the creepiness of the bayou back roads is unmatched. I've had naked, or at least shirtless men in ragged old pickups, waiting on the side of the road at night, try to follow me as I passed, and other assorted, stereotypical, rural fuckery. But the weirdest one wasn't stereotypical at all. While I was traveling I-10 one afternoon, I noticed the Prius pacing me in my blind spot and blocking me in my lane. I have them a moment to pass, and when they didn't, I began slowing down. They matched my speed. This continues for several miles, and my go-ahead wave has been ignored. So I'm finally tired of going well under the speed limit, so I slow down and then punch it, taking advantage of my better acceleration to make a path ahead of them, and I shoot off about 95 miles per hour. They're speeding up now too. They stay with inside of me for the next 25 miles or so, matching my speed from 55 behind a slow truck to almost 100. They won't pass. They won't go away. I finagle traffic such that I exit the freeway without them being able to follow. I pull off to get some gas. I do my thing and rejoin the freeway, only to pass them sitting on the shoulder a short ways up as if they were waiting for me. Well, now I'm properly spooked. 
so I made sure I took note of their license plate, and I continued my journey. I didn't see them again for a few miles, but here they come again, tailgating me. They stay within sight of me for the next 45 minutes or so, matching my speed and lane selection. At this point, I've had enough, so I again finagle traffic and force them beside me. The middle-aged couple inside the car are staring at me with the most intense look of hatred I've ever seen. I'm not ashamed to admit that my blood ran cold when I saw the look of pure rage in their faces. I give a what-did-I-do sort of shrug gesture, and the male passenger gives a sarcastic, slightly crazed-looking smile and he does a you-better-think gesture at his head, followed by the universal signal for cutting a throat. The female driver is all over the road as she stares over at me, forcing me over partially onto the shoulder. Incensed and obviously nervous, I give him the finger and pin the throttle. I take off at go directly to jail speeds. I didn't stop until their car had faded into the distance and then I took an alternate route through some more curvy country roads and made sure I disappeared. I'm reasonably certain that I didn't cut them off prior to this incident, and I didn't recognize them at all. I have no idea what their problem was with me, but I'm kind of glad I didn't give them a chance to tell me. I work at a lab at the University of South Florida late, as I like to do my work with no one else around. My partner is just a short ways off campus, about a 10 minute drive and a 40 or so minute walk, depending on what I took. While I do live in Tampa, it's far and away from the cities. There's no three story buildings in sight, a few neighborhoods, ample amounts of trees and ponds at the stone's throw from a rather sizable state park of 240 acres, which in turn is adjacent to a substantially larger wilderness area. What that means is a lot of wildlife. I regularly see deer grazing on a golf course nearby. Growing alligators roam the ponds and small lakes. Turtles about. Plenty of vultures, storks, and smaller birds. And much, much more. On my nightly walks or drives, I often heard or even seen foxes, bobcats, coyotes, or even a black bear once. So you can imagine when I found out several cats and small dogs had gone missing, I naturally thought that if a predator was responsible, it'd be one of the larger coyotes, bobcats, or maybe even a bear or gator. People, especially in gated communities, leave their pets out to roam about in the day or at night. Still, that did leave a question of how a predator could, or would, get over several fences and gates, some of which would be quite the hassle to climb, and there was no sign of being tunneled under. Why go for a pet inside a box that would be hard to get out of, when fat ducks were extremely abundant? Well, I got my answer in a way I never expected. I was driving back from the lab late, around 11pm, when I stopped as I could see an animal in the road. The figure was very tall, but also very thin, so I initially thought the pale color I saw to be from viewing a deer from behind. However, I soon noticed the animal was actually pale all over its main body and had extremely thin, dark legs. When it raised itself up somewhat, I realized I was looking at a great white heron from behind. Great white herons are a regional color morph of great blue herons, being nearly all white in coloration, including the trademark tassels coming off the brows of the birds, save for the top jaw and feet, which are both dark blue or black. The white form usually only appears in very southern Florida, but occasionally one will show up further north. They also tend to be on the larger end of the species size. I make no jest when I note how big this avian was. Standing up straight, some of the bigger great herons can look a grown man in the eye behind a nearly foot-long, rapier-shaped beak. The heron was throwing its head up and down and was clearly doing something, but I couldn't be sure of what. 
It was standing in the road about 200 yards ahead of my car and only reacted when I got closer. It swung its head around and I'll never forget the sight right as I stopped 10 yards away. The heron was standing still, unflinching as its eyes brightly reflected in the headlights. The white feathers across the chest and the part of the wing were stained a tarry red from coagulating blood as it had half of a cat hanging out of its mouth. Herons can gulp down surprisingly large prey, such as big fish, muskrats, bullfrogs, and even young alligators. But it's one thing to see them swallow a wild creature whole, in still frame or in pixels on a video. It's a whole different ordeal to see one doing it in the flesh, after having killed its prey by impaling them on the beach. When I compared their beak to a rapier earlier, I mean it. They can impale that thing through the armored scales of a garfish. Herons have been known to kill eagles by ramming their beaks through the latter's chest. The poor cat never stood a chance. The heron didn't at all seem phased by my arrival. Instead, it flicked the dead cat back and forth some to position it in its mouth before tilting its head up. You know that shot from Jurassic Park? with the Tyrannosaurus swallowing the goat. Same sort of visual at first, only with another disgusting detail. When the heron started swallowing, its thin neck bulged outwards to accommodate the food. It kept its eyes pointed straight at me, as the big wad of slain feline slowly worked down its throat to the crop, sometimes a limb visibly impressing outwards from the stretched skin. All the while, the heron let out raspy breaths while standing still, still spattered in gore from pecking the poor cat to death. And after it finally swallows its prey, the heron paced closer and to the side of the road. It actually got next to the car at one point. It was close enough I could confirm its height to be about five feet or more, because the top of its head was level with my side mirror. It was at that point I realized I had the windows partially rolled down. I was smelling the sanguine musk of death. The damn bird was level with my window, looking right at me and leaning closer. Needless to say, that snapped me out of my stupor. I blared the horn to make it back off. On the menu or not, I didn't at all like how it was looking at me. Driving down the road and making the turn, I could still see it looking towards the car as it paced down the darkened sidewalks, like it was the most casual thing ever for a four to five foot tall predator, half covered in blood, to be there. Obviously I was in no direct danger myself, being in the car, and decidedly not on the menu, but I didn't like it all the way it looked at me. This avian predator clearly didn't at all fear people even if it seemed conscious of cars and my presence. And given this happened at a gated community, I'd never seen any mammalian predators bigger than a possum man. I think I now know what was eating the pets. We often can hear nowadays that birds are living dinosaurs, but I don't think some quite register that, as the feather heads they're familiar with are fat city pigeons or delicious fowl. I think seeing this would help get the message across. And at night, every so often, I still can hear the deep, throaty shrieks that species gives off, flying over from the forests and swamps, and in to the neighborhoods. Don't leave your pets outside. This incident happened in 2018. My then boyfriend and I were on a road trip during the winter of 2018. We took a day to visit the Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. For anyone who hasn't been there, you drive down a long road that winds through the landscape and exit at various stops along the way to view different points of interest. We were only at maybe our second or third stop when we encountered the creek. This particular stop has a white parking lot with a handful of large educational signs at either end, 
and a path that leads up to a historic site and various vantage points. As we made our way up the path to the main site, a man was coming down toward the parking lot. He looked pretty much exactly like Mr. Clean, but in a red t-shirt and jeans. He was tall, upwards of six foot two. As we passed each other, he muttered something odd under his breath though it was clearly intended to get our attention. My boyfriend turned around and asked him what he said, and the man looked at us, almost stunned, for a moment, before he seemed to decide to come up with something else to say. He pointed into the distance and asked, What's that over there? All there was over there was some kind of utility box, the road through the park, and desert. We brushed him off, said we didn't know, and turned to continue up the path, when he called out, See you later, pretty girl. There's hardly a woman alive who hasn't had something like this said to her 10,000 times before, but this felt unusually sinister, and it set my nerves on edge. We both decided to just ignore him, and headed up to the rest of the site. After 15 to 20 minutes of looking around, I finally had to admit to my boyfriend, that I felt like we were being watched. He nodded and said, That guy hasn't left. He's been watching us the entire time. From where we were standing up on a hill, we could see the parking lot. I noticed our creep standing near an educational sign that was off on its own at the far edge of the parking lot, but he was clearly positioned to see up the hill at us. We were both bugged by it, but we resolved to not let it ruin our time or get too bent out of shape about it. We took our time at the stop, shook off the nerves, and by the time we went back to the parking lot, he'd gone. We drove another mile or two to the next vantage point, which included a number of petroglyphs on a cliff wall that you could see using binoculars. You have to take a narrow road into the parking lot, which creates a bit of a bottleneck. As we're about to enter, a blue RAV4 pulls in front of us, and blocks us from coming in. It was the same creep. After a few moments of intense eye contact with my boyfriend, the guy slowly pulled away and let us enter the lot. He left, so we told ourselves we were overthinking it, but decided to spend a good long time where we were to let him get well ahead of us so we could stop running into each other. Our next stop, a mile loop hike, was, if I remember, about three and a half miles away. We figured we'd spent enough time at the petroglyphs that even if the guy was at our next destination, he'd either be close to being done with the hike or leaving by now. Unfortunately, he waited for us. About two miles up the road, we spotted the blue RAV4 pulled over on the side of the road. The man was standing next to the car, sort of looking vaguely into the distance. The landscape is beautiful in the park, even though there was nothing especially spectacular about this spot, maybe he was just taking it all in away from crowds. As we drove by, I looked behind us. He turned to watch us and stared at our car driving away until we rounded a corner and couldn't see him anymore. When we got to the parking lot and got out to take the hike, we were both feeling rattled. My boyfriend, who normally tolerated creepiness in others to a fault, was so shaken by the vibes this guy gave off that he actually stashed the little window-breaking hammer out of his car safety kit in his hoodie pocket, just in case we needed something for self-defense. I guess that sounds nuts now, but it's just one of those things we all do to feel a little safer when we get creeped out. The hike itself is down at the bottom of this kind of valley. You walk down the steep winding path to the bottom, where the path splits and forms a circuit around this area that includes all these cool little hillocks of painted rock dotted with petrified wood. We made it all the way down to the beginning of the loop when we noticed the guy at the top of the cliff off the parking lot looking down our way. We were about half of the way around the loop when we saw this guy at the base of the hill about to start. We were relieved because we knew we'd been out there before him this time and we felt like we could finally shake him and stop feeling weirded out. For most of the loop, you can see the whole path and the whole hill up to the parking lot, but for the middle section of the walk, 
you are shielded from view behind those little hillocks and different topography. When we emerged near at the end of the loop, we were still feeling good, but we did take a quick look to place our creep before heading back up. We didn't see him anywhere. Maybe he decided not to do the walk. Maybe he was behind one of those little hills. As we made our way back up the steep path, we noticed him up at the top, just waiting by the informational sign. Switchback after switchback, he stayed put, apparently intently reading the sign. The closer we got, we noticed he was now holding something. As we got to the top of the path, where we knew we'd have to pass within inches of him, we tightened up, locked arms, and prepared to march right past as quickly as we could. Even though lots of people were walking by him, coming and going, he waited for us to cross his path. It turns out that what he now had in his hands was a window washing squeegee and a spray bottle with something in it. As we tried to walk past him, he turned to us and said, Hey, can you help me? I'm running out of time. And he started to hold up the spray bottle and squeegee. My boyfriend was in no mood and said, No, leave us alone, in a pretty harsh tone, as we kept walking. The guy, smiling, replied, Well, fuck you too. Nice ass though, both of you, and started determinedly following us. He was gaining on us by the time we got to the car, and I barely made it in and locked the door before he was right next to my window staring in at me. Even though I was freaked the hell out, and my instinct was to just keep my head down, I didn't want to give him the upper hand and let him make me cower. So I looked up and stared right into his eyes. Just thinking about it makes my stomach turn. He was right up next to my window, staring in unblinking, with his hand up in a frozen wave and smiling. When I looked into his eyes, the first thought I had was that he wanted to skin me alive. It sounds completely insane to say, but I think anyone who's had an encounter with someone like this will relate. When someone means you harm, there's something that kicks in and you feel it in this deep, strange way. My boyfriend had the presence of mind to start snapping pictures of the guy, who then moved around our car to try and keep us from driving away. My boyfriend started revving the engine, trying to get him to move. It didn't work. He just kept blocking us. So we started inching the car forward. He still didn't move. We tapped him. He stumbled back a bit, but kept standing there. Then we noticed there was a family a couple of cars over, staring at us over their lunch. Then the creep noticed too, smiled that nasty smile and gave us just enough room for us to get out of the parking spot, and we sped away. As we passed the family, the man in the front seat gave us an encouraging nod. It was sort of like, we saw that, we're watching you, we've got your back. I immediately called the park office and told them about what was going on. They sent a ranger out to check on the guy. We headed to Winslow, Arizona, and stopped at a bar to have a drink and tried to chill out. We were so freaked out that we actually checked the car for a tracking device, which also sounds crazy, but it was one of those situations where the vibe the guy was giving off turned the emotion of the events way, way up past what seems normal. Later that night, we got a call from the ranger who told us that they ended up having to arrest the guy for disorderly conduct. They asked us to provide a statement of our experience. I tried to find out more about it, or what happened after we left, but I haven't been successful. I'm so curious if this guy sounds familiar to anyone else, especially the weird window washing ploy. We, in all our adrenaline, had all kinds of wacky theories that maybe there was poison in the bottle, or the squeegee had a knife hidden in it or something. I'm sure we were overblowing it, but I've never been able to stop feeling like we dodged a bullet with that guy. Back in December of 2020, I went to Cancun for our vacation. 
It was one of our dreams to visit this beautiful country and enjoy their food, their culture, and their history. There was one incident that turned out to be really scary and terrible to remember. Our first day, we decided to go visit the pyramids in Chichen Itza. We had rented a car, so it would be a nice and long trip to the place, since it's pretty retired from the hotel zone. We followed Google Maps, which took us through a really lonely road. It was really early in the morning, so we never thought it was something weird. At the middle of the road, we were stopped by a group of federal policemen, which had the Yucatan insignia on their uniforms. We're going to the Chichen Itza. You have to cross to another state in Mexico. I assume this was kind of the borderline between Quintana Roo State and Chichen Itza. The first thing they said was that everyone inside the vehicle should be using a seatbelt. They said they would make us a fine, which we would have to pay. But then the conversation became really weird. They asked us where we came from. We of course said Colombia. They then took my dad out of the car and took him away from us, over to a place we couldn't see him. They told us all Colombians were rats, that they are the ones committing more crimes in Yucatan. We got really scared. At that moment, a small group of cars passed by, but they weren't stopped. I got nervous as fuck. It was in the middle of nowhere, and they were heavily armed and holding their guns. At that moment, I freaked out. After some minutes, my dad came back. Of course, they let him go after he bribed them. He then told us that they were asking who he was, what his job was, and who knew he was on a trip to Mexico. In the end, we all had the same thought in that car. Those guys could have killed us on that road and no one would have known. We could say this was a classic police corruption case, but their attitude toward us was really suspicious. We felt threatened. It's a bitter memory from that trip, luckily. That happened the first day, but the rest of our journey throughout Mexico was beautiful. To start out, this story sort of takes place on and off again throughout most of my life. It starts out as typical. My parents got a divorce when I was young situation, but it unfolded into so much more. In fact, I'm still picking up the pieces of everything that happened. As it stands now, my father is dead. It was ruled as a suicide, but I think that was only half of what happened. I'll talk about everything that led up to this, but more importantly, I believe that Mary definitely had a hand in what happened. My mother and father divorced when I was around four. Almost everyone I know has gone through some sort of similar situation. I have two brothers, one older and one younger. We saw my father about every other weekend. He paid child support. You get the gist. One weekend visit. My father introduces us to a woman he see. She's named Mary. Her eyes and hair are dark, and her skin is pale. She had an obsession with the color red. Something was immediately off to me, but I didn't really start to know what she was capable of until later. I didn't know it at the time, but Mary is one of the main reasons my parents got divorced. My father cheated on my mother with her, he met her while he was working as a waiter at Red Lobster. When he moved over to his career at a casino as a slot machine repairman, she followed. Mary would follow my dad everywhere. They got married pretty quickly after my mother and father divorced. I never even knew there was a wedding until later. My mother hated her, but she never badmouthed my father or Mary in front of my brothers and I. She felt that it was important for us to make judgments for ourselves, even if this woman was a part of the reason her marriage was broken up. We continued to visit what was now Dad and Mary's house on our scheduled time with Dad. I always associated their house with red. Their house was always decorated with strawberries. Mary liked red sheets. She had red sweaters and pants. It was weird. Mary was just unnecessary drama for a while. Things like buying us toys that we could only keep at my dad's and Mary's house, 
or saying that she and my father wanted custody of us instead of my mom. I feel like these things were harmless in a way. Every divorcing couple probably has some sort of variation. Things carried on like this for a couple of years. We would have a special variation of Christmas or Easter or whatever, aside from what we celebrated with my mom. I was about seven or eight when I remembered the first incident that confirmed that I knew this wasn't right. My brother was a super curious child and he was about four. He had scooted a dining table chair to the fridge to get to a cereal box on top, and when he reached up, he pulled down a handgun instead of a cereal box. I panicked and got my dad, who acted really funny about it. My memory is fuzzy, but I remember going home early that weekend. My dad didn't know the gun was there because it was Mary's. It was at this point that my mom started to have trouble with us going over there. My father got worse about being able to come pick us up. He was unreliable for the most part to begin with, but I know that he was ten times worse when he was around Mary. My mom told me later, when I was much older, that Mary called our house around the time of the gun incident and said, I want your life. My mother is a really tough lady. She grew up in East LA in California. This scared her. She was going to get a restraining order soon. I guess what Mary meant was that she wanted my mom's stability. Even as a single mom with three kids, she was doing very well for herself and even dating. But even so, how long had she been obsessed with my mom before she and my father ever got divorced? What did that even mean? Not long after the phone call, my mom heard her car being smashed into one night. Someone had taken a brick and smashed the driver window. Nothing was taken. I know it was Mary. We had no way to prove it, but I just know. My dad and Mary had a baby. Her name is Madison. I only remember holding and playing with her for so long. I can't imagine all the shit she's been through. My mom met and married my stepdad pretty soon after that, and they decided that it would be best to move to Florida. We had other family there, and there weren't many jobs where we were living in Tennessee. I don't remember any problems at all when we were so far from my dad and Mary. We stayed for about a year, and then we moved back to Tennessee. My stepdad was able to get a better job again, and we were closer to my mom's parents. This is when the phone call starts. As soon as we moved back, we would get phone calls where someone would just listen for a few minutes, and then they would hang up. The numbers were always blocked, but I'm sure it was her. She always knew where we lived because we started seeing my dad again. The calls continued for years. It became like an inside joke. We all knew who it was, but there wasn't anything we could do. My father denied it. Anytime I asked him about it, he took her side. We fell into this thing where my mom was the bad guy, and any time I questioned my dad and Mary's behavior, they were sure my mom was putting me up to it. Things escalated one night when my dad came to pick us up for a visit. My mom and Mary ended up getting into a fist fight, where Mary swung first and my mom punched her so hard she fell backwards. My brothers and I watched from the apartment we were living in at the time. My mom went immediately to the police, but my dad and Mary never even called. My mom didn't press any charges, and the whole incident sort of faded away. We ended up moving into a bigger house a while after that, where we still are today. My dad and Mary started to have problems and split up. I thought maybe she would be gone for good, or at least gone for the most part, but she never really went away. My dad started to become a person we could somewhat rely on again when she was gone. I got to know my little sister more, and things were okay. Mary started coming around again though. Whenever she was with my dad in front of us, she would whisper in his ear. My dad would drink more. He became physically ill looking and would start to gain weight. We could always tell when Mary was around because the difference was so drastic. He even officially divorced her at one point, but it was obvious that they still got together on and off. 
My brothers and I went on with our lives, and we became too old for visiting the way we were. Whole weekend visits became just going to see my dad for an evening. The whole time, however, the phone calls never stopped. They weren't as frequent, but they were there in the background. It was like a reminder that she was always there, lurking. When I got into high school, visits from my dad just about stopped altogether. We usually talked on the phone here and there, and I saw him when I had events like a marching band competition, a formal dance, milestones like graduating high school. It was pretty common to go a while without hearing from him sometimes. Mary was only a thought. I hadn't seen her in years. I never saw her anywhere at all. The phone calls had stopped but only because we'd gotten rid of the house phone. I was a freshman in college, and I remember it being right around Halloween of 2009. I was shopping with my aunt for some cheap decorations at the Walmart by my house. I saw a woman walking slowly behind us, and my aunt and I both did a double take. It was Mary. She was totally following us around the store. She looked like she was maybe 50 years older than when I last saw her and her clothes were disheveled. My aunt kept elbowing me to go talk to her, because we weren't exactly sure if this really was her. It could have been someone who just looked really similar. I worked up the nerve and went up to her. Is your name Mary? I asked. Yes, it is. Hi, Samantha. How are you? Using my name like that really caught me off guard. She knew who I was and wasn't bothering to talk to me. She didn't even act like she was being caught. I asked her if she talked to my dad lately, because it had been a while since I heard from him. She swore up and down that she hadn't spoken to him for months, which I later found out was a lie. This was the beginning of my dad going missing. After I saw her, something happened, and it's hard to pin down what, but he completely disappeared. His cell phone was shut off and when I called his work at the casino, where he'd been working for over 15 years, they said that he was no longer working there, and they couldn't tell me why. My mom and brothers and I called the police to file a missing persons report. We didn't have to wait, because it had already been several weeks since we'd heard from him. They helped us make a flyer, and we looked and asked all over. Everything led back to Mary, most likely being the last one to see him alive. By the time we started talking to her, it was mid-November. My mom and I called Mary, and she would tell us that she had, in fact, seen my dad on the night after Halloween. Mary told us that he was making a noose, and this would be the last time anyone ever saw him. We honestly didn't know what to believe. My dad was an alcoholic. It wasn't uncommon for him to say dramatic stuff, but we never considered suicide. When we told the detectives what Mary had told us, they had her come in for questioning. She told the detectives a completely different story, and her dates kept changing. There wasn't any evidence of anything, though, so there wasn't much they could do. The detectives did, however, tell us that we shouldn't talk to her anymore. To quote them, we don't know what she's capable of. Things went on like this until they found him on January 4, 2010. My dad was found dead in a storage unit. He had pulled his car in, shut the unit door, and let it run until he died. He'd been there for 63 days. There were several suicide notes, all dated for November 2nd. One for my mom, one for each of his children. But there was an especially long note for Mary, where he dotted on her and talked about what a wonderful woman she was. The suicide note even said for her to take any insurance money and to use it on herself. The date on the notes was so close to the date where Mary said she'd seen it. There are a million things that could have happened, but I know she had something to do with it. Even if my father did kill himself, I know that she helped push him over the edge. 
I'm not one to just blame someone. I know my father was a troubled man. He was an alcoholic, and he was depressed most of the time. But there's something frustrating and horrendous about this woman, and there's zero evidence for me to prove anything against her. She wasn't allowed to come to the funeral. My mom and parts of his family put everything together. There wasn't anyone he knew that hadn't heard of her, and everyone felt that she was a bad woman. I found a Facebook profile of hers months after they found my dad. There were only five or six photos of her and some guy, obviously happy. They were all dated for January 4th, 2010. The next year on, on January 4th, 2011, she showed up at my family's house. We didn't let her in the house, and she kept saying something about having some of my dad's stuff in the car. We told her to leave, or else we would call the police. That night, Someone put red tissue paper in and around our mailbox. Even the next year, 2012, she called my mom and asked her to meet her in a Sonic Burger parking lot. She said she had a box of my dad's stuff to give us. My mom made my stepdad go instead of her, but she never showed. I feel like she wanted to do something bad to my mom. The next year, we didn't hear from her. I did some research. And it turns out, she was put in jail for making men. It made a lot of sense for some of the things, but I still have so many questions and issues that are unanswered. Supposedly she was let out sometime in the summer of 2014. The correctional facility she was at has a website, and it says she was let out for good behavior and rehab. I found a different Facebook that showed her with some other family. God help them if she's pulling the same shit as she did with mine. Now my little brother works at a video game store. It was around 8pm one night, and Madison, Mary's daughter, came in to buy a video game. My little brother was shocked and he didn't recognize her. She introduced herself and my little brother couldn't do much. She asked for his phone number, but my brother didn't end up giving it to her because he had a weird feeling in his stomach. She took what she bought and left, and my little brother thought that was the end of it. But maybe five to ten minutes later, in walks Madison again, with Mary by her side. My little brother immediately recognized her and started to panic. Mary and Madison stood at the back of the store, whispering to each other. He said that they were both smiling the whole time, and a couple of times they giggled at each other. Mary then looked at him right in the eyes, and started to head towards the counter my brother was behind. He said that he felt so angry and his heart started to race. Instead of trying to confront her, he walked into the back of the store and let his co-worker ask if he could help her. Maybe ten minutes later, she was gone. His co-worker told him that she left without asking for anything. My brother thinks that she was just making her presence known and that she could catch up with him, like they were friends or something. I just don't want this in my life anymore. I don't want her harassing my family members, and I want to move as far away as possible. We documented this incident with the police department, and they said if it happens three times, then we can file for a restraining order. I don't really know what else to do. As much as I thought it finally might be over, she pops right back up again. It's not enough for her that my dad is dead. I guess she wants to have the last word. She always wanted to have the upper hand. I thought I would tell you my story about a creepy encounter I had eight years ago. To allow the creepy reality of the situation to sink in, I feel I need to describe myself. I'm a woman, five foot exactly and about 50 kilograms, so I'm not particularly skinny, but I suppose I had a bit of fat and muscle on me. The one seemingly universal thing that people notice about me when they find out my age is how young they think I look. It may be due to my height 
or to my small round baby face? I don't know to be honest. All I know is I'm 25 now, but many people assume I'm under 18. So when I was 17, it was common for many people to assume I was about 12 to 13. To start off my story, I'll give you some background information. My parents love traveling, so they're always going off somewhere. Their next trip was to Tasmania for two weeks to do the Cradle Mountain walking group, as well as visit other various sites. I was 17 at the time, and it was the school holidays, but I wasn't particularly interested in going with them. My parents decided it'd probably be better for me to stay with my nan up in Sydney, because I was going through a really rough time with my mental health issues, and they didn't trust me on my own. I liked the idea of staying with my nan, because her house is only a five minute walk to the train station, and it's only a two minute train ride to Miranda Fair. She has Foxtel cable TV, and live close to the park and shops. It was good for me to get out of my small town and away from all the shit I had to put up with. On one particular day, I asked my nan if I could go to Miranda Fair. I told her I'd be okay on my own, and I'd have my phone with me if anything happened. She seemed concerned, but she eventually let me go. I got to the station, paid for my ticket, and found there weren't many people waiting. I got to a seat and sat down and started listening to my MP3 whilst waiting for the train to arrive. I looked up to my left and barely noticed the guy who looked in his mid-thirties sitting on a seat a few meters away from me. He was a smallish and skinny looking guy, short messy dark hair, unshaven and wearing a brown jacket and jeans. He looked at me, but I didn't take any notice. A group of old ladies walked near me, and I asked if they'd like to take my seat, which they politely declined. I noticed that the same guy had turned his head in my direction, but I continued to ignore it, thinking he was staring in the distance. The train eventually pulled up, and everyone got up to pile on. I walked for the door closest to me, and I figured that since it was only a two-minute ride, I wouldn't bother sitting down. The train started moving, and within seconds, the same man with the brown jacket was standing next to me. I ignored him, but he continued to stand very close to me. When I eventually looked up at him, he was already staring at me. Hi there, he said, smiling. Hi, I said politely, but not smiling back. I continued to ignore him. I thought it was weird that a man his age was trying to engage with me. There was no one else in the compartment apart from us, and for a split second, I felt trepidation. Come down the bottom and sit with me, he said smiling and gesturing to the compartment below. I looked around me to find no one standing by. A feeling in my gut made me feel slightly sick. It was just me and him. He was staring at me intently, and I felt myself follow him. I didn't want to appear like I was rude. I mean, all he wanted to do was sit. We sat down, and I sat in the seat opposite him, staring out the window. Do you live around here? He asked, still smiling that creepy smile. No, I replied. Are you visiting? Yeah, that's cool. Who are you visiting? He was leaning closer in his seat. He seemed way too enthusiastic for such simple small talk. Family, I said. At this point, that feeling in my gut is so much worse. Who the hell was this guy and why was he so interested in me? We sat in silence and I stare out the window and he chances a few lingering stares at me. The hairs on my neck start prickling, and I can't stop fidgeting with my hands. I decided to get up and walk back to the top compartment as I was nearing my station. I remember the silent mantra in my head, playing over and over again. Please don't follow me. Please don't follow me. Please don't follow me. It was futile, however, as I heard his footsteps behind me and a sudden touch on my arm. I froze. You heading to Miranda too? Same here, 
He smiled, and all I remembered is my gut dropping. I'm not sure how he could have noticed the look on my face. I wasn't smiling. I wasn't happy. I wanted him to fuck off. The doors opened, and I quickly got out at my stop. A strange man followed me. I tried to walk fast, but he kept up with me. By this point I was scared. I didn't know what he was capable of, who he was, or what his intentions were. He was chatting to me casually. I don't even remember what he said. He didn't seem to care that I was taking zero notice of him, nor responding to anything he said. As we're nearing the mall, he sticks his hand out for a handshake and introduces himself as Steve. I felt obligated to shake it and tell him my name. My handshakes are usually firm, but this time it was like a limp fish. So, are you hungry? I'll buy you lunch. No. Do you want a milkshake or something? Uh, no. By this point, it sinks in that this creep wasn't just really bad at picking up on social cues. In my mind, he was a predator, plain and simple. I knew I had to shake him off, but I didn't know how. As we got closer to JB Hi-Fi, I turned to face him and say, Well, thanks for the chat. I'm gonna head off now and look around. Nice to have met you. Bye. By this point, he should have gotten the hint that I was onto him. Yet instead, he smiles and says casually, I will walk with you. Right now, I'm on the verge of a panic attack. Believe me, I would have loved to have told him to fuck off and leave me alone, but I was too scared. I didn't know how he'd react. Would he lash out or what? I quickly walk into the nearest shop and start browsing, whilst feeling like I was in a trance-like state. Steve was still on my tail browsing with me. At one point, Steve walked to the other aisle briefly, and I remember seeing a man with his family. I walk over to him slowly and imagine myself asking him to save me from this man. However, as if he was reading my mind, Steve appeared before I could say anything. I was almost in tears now. I felt helpless. I walked to the middle of the store where there was a table stacked with a bunch of DVDs that were half price. My left hand was gripping the top of the table. I wasn't even looking at them. And like magic, Steve appeared beside me. Not much here to look at, is there? He says in an almost mischievous way. Suddenly, I felt something against my left hand. Something hard, yet soft. When I looked, he had discreetly pushed the crotch of his jeans against my hand, and I'm pretty sure you can guess what I felt. I quickly pulled my hand away and felt myself feel like I was going to faint. My vision was blurry and my mind was scrambling. I wanted to puke and to sink through the floor all at the same time. I couldn't scream or fight back. I truly felt so vulnerable. I spotted the store's bag checker at the entrance of the store. I stare at him pleadingly. He ignores me. Everyone seemed oblivious to what was happening. Steve eventually walked back to the CD section of the shop, yet he could still keep an eye on me if he had to. By this point, he'd been following me for almost an hour, probably more. I needed to do something. I took a leap of faith and suddenly approached the same bag checker. Please help me. That man won't stop following me. I'm not security, he replies unhelpfully. I could have lost my shit right there to be honest. I was frustrated, angry, scared, anxious. Can't you do anything? He won't stop. By this point, tears were coming out. I'd had enough. He looks over to where he was, and then says in the most nonchalant of tones, he's looking at the CDs, just walk out of here. At that point, I didn't care. I bolted. I ran out of the store as fast as I could. I ran into the ground floor parking lot, and I didn't stop running. I ran up three or four parking levels, 
Meanwhile, dodging cars and not looking back until I saw an elevator, I ran inside it and pushed it to the very top level. Once I got out, I ran into the nearest restroom and locked myself in the stall where I sobbed for half an hour. I was too scared to come out. I didn't know if he tried to follow me, or maybe he didn't realize I was gone until it was too late, or if the bag checker said something to him. I eventually came out of the restroom after what seemed like forever. It took me three quarters of an hour for me to feel remotely safe again. I wouldn't walk out of a shop unless I scanned the area beforehand. I ended up making it back to my nan's okay. The next day, as I walked to the local shops with my grandma, I started to feel like myself again. I casually watched a white ute go by as I chatted with my nan and my heart stopped. It was Steve, staring at me. I never saw him again after that. I don't know what he was thinking or what he wanted with me, but I'm glad I didn't stick around to find out. I never told anyone about what happened. I always felt too ashamed and it was somehow my fault that it happened. I often replay all the things I could have done or said to protect myself better, but I didn't and I always felt weak for that. So Steve, let's not meet again. I'm a 35 year old female and my story takes place when I was 15, but it feels like yesterday. It was the day that would change my innocent youth forever. I'm from a little village in Ireland with a population of a few hundred. The nearest town is about 10 miles away. Growing up in rural Ireland was very idealistic. Summers were spent playing football with the neighbors or going to the lake swimming till the sun went down. I was lucky that even though the population was small and the houses are far apart, my best friend's house was only down the road. So during those summer months, Mary and I were inseparable. My friend and I grew up with lots of brothers and sisters in a safe village. We were given a lot of freedom, and sometimes we were gone all day, and only came back before dark. As it was the mid-90s, we had no mobile phones, but our moms knew we would be okay and look out for each other. One thing we liked to do during these summers, besides going to the lake and hanging out at each other's houses, was go to town and look around the shops. The easiest way to get to town was to hitchhike, as there were no buses. Here in Ireland, we call it thumbing. Hardly anyone hitches now because most households have two cars and parents are a lot more protective. But back in the 80s and 90s, it was very common. Our parents were okay with it, but there were certain rules we had to follow. I'm not entirely sure who came up with the rules, but I assume our parents did. Rule number one, never hitch alone. You must thumb with at least one or two friends. Number two, never take a lift if there are two or more men in the car, but two or more women is fine. Number three, never take a lift from someone in a van. There could be more guys hiding in the back, or worse, ropes, blindfolds, and that kind of thing. Number four, this was the most important rule. When a car stops to pick you up, always ask the driver where they're going first. If you tell them where you're going first, they could pretend they're going to the same place to lure you in. We were innocent but had common sense, so we followed the rules down to a T. Well, at least we tried to. My friend Mary and I used to hitch once a week during the summer. We would go to town with a population of a few thousand and look around the shops, eat ice cream, and hang out. When we got a ride, we had to make small talk with the driver, and his two shy 15-year-olds, this bit sucked the most. To make it fair, we took turns sitting in the front and did most of the talking. One day we spent a few hours in town. It was pretty uneventful, so we decided to thumb back. At around 3 p.m., we went to the usual spot to hitch from, just on the outskirts of the town. We were only waiting about five minutes when a white car pulled up. 
Before we could ask where he was going, he asked us first. My friend told him, and he said he was passing through our village on the way to another one. Rule number four broken, but he seemed nice enough and we just wanted to go home. It was my turn to sit in the front. The driver introduced himself as John, a farmer, and he was really friendly. He was dressed in a worn t-shirt with holes in it. He had tattered pants and smelled like cow shit. The car was full of bits of straw and was old and battered like the driver. He was about 60, and he had no wedding ring on. Don't ask me why, but I always notice these things. About halfway between town and our home village, he asked if we heard a noise. No, we replied. There it is again. It sounds like a banging noise, he said. I didn't hear anything, so I just sat there quietly. I think it might be the exhaust pipe, he said. I'll have to pull in and have a look. He pulled up on a busy road and went out to take a look. I didn't hear anything, Mary said to me. He seems like a weirdo, I said. Call it intuition, but even though he was really friendly and chatty, I got a bad feeling from him. Next thing he comes back to the driver's side and tells us that the exhaust is hanging down and was hitting the road. He needs us to help him tie it up. It was then I noticed he had string holding up his pants instead of a belt. I thought this was odd. Anyway, he got some more string and we both got out of the car. I got a bad vibe from him. I didn't feel scared at this stage. We were on a busy road and it was about 3.30pm, so we both got out of the car. He showed us the exhaust pipe hanging down and used a rag to hold it up because it was hot. My friend Mary took over holding it up, while he secured it with string. They were both kneeling while I just stood back and watched. It was then I noticed his fly was open, and I could see his privates. He was clearly not wearing any underwear. He didn't even have a belt on, so I guess I wasn't surprised. In my head I thought, oh fuck, what's going on? Oh shit, but I said nothing. I just stood there in shock. Mary hadn't noticed at this stage and just continued to hold the pipe. When John was standing up, he noticed his fly was open and act all shocked. Oh, girls, I'm so sorry and embarrassed. I only have a safety pin holding the fly together and it must have come off. Please forgive me and get back in the car. Mary was stunned because she got a close-up of his privates, which left me to do the talking. I told him it was okay and that it was an accident, so we got back in the car. He fastened the safety pin, even though I didn't see him look for it. All was hidden again. Back in the car, the atmosphere was very different. We both felt mortified and he kept apologizing over and over. I looked out the passenger window and repeated, It's okay, it's okay. Then he said something that turned my stomach. Well, girls, you're taking it very well. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear you liked it. Then he nudged me in the arm with his arm, like what you would do with a friend. I looked at him through the corner of my eye, my face still facing the window, when I noticed his fly was undone again, and he was exposed once more. He must have noticed me looking, because he said, Oh, sorry, the safety pin keeps opening. Just don't look. Fine by me, I thought, but I said okay and continued to look out the window. He kept nudging me and saying, don't be lucky, whilst giggling at the same time. He was doing this in a playful way, like this was a joke. Mary started to giggle too, because when she's nervous, she laughs. I knew it wasn't her fault, but I was getting angry at this stage. He wouldn't stop telling me to stop looking. And then he said, your friend is laughing. She must be enjoying the view. This made her laugh even harder. Now remember, we are both polite 15 year olds that always respect our elders. We're a little shy and I would never speak up to an adult. The nudging of my arm and my friend laughing was all getting too much. He'd asked if it was the first time I'd ever seen one. He once again told me to stop looking. 
I was turned, facing the passenger window, so much that I had my back to him. There was no way I could be looking. I lost my temper. I shouted at the top of my lungs. I'm not fucking looking. Mary, shut up fucking laughing. Silence followed. He said he was sorry, that he was only joking, and I didn't need to be so serious. I said nothing, and sat there red with temper. I should have told him to let us out. I should have told him to cover himself up, the dirty old pervert. But I was in shock too. Part of me wanted to believe it was all an innocent mistake. We finally arrived at our tiny, safe village. We got out and he said again that he was sorry about the whole thing. My friend got her voice back and assured him it was okay. I said it was all okay and not to worry about it. I said thanks for the lift. What he said back sickened me. He looked me up and down with this creepy smile and said, Girlies, thanks for everything. And he drove off. We were left speechless. We sat down on a nearby bench to process all of this before going home. We made a deal we would not tell our parents, or they'd never let us hitchhike again. My friend got her voice back and repeated, Pervert, sicko, smelly bastard. He had this plan the whole time, over and over. About five minutes after sitting down on the bench, who drives past going the direction we just came from? Only pervert Farmer John, waving and smiling while we sat stunned. He had beeped to catch our attention. So much for passing through our village. A few months later, and the ordeal went to the back of my mind. Occasionally we would talk about Farmer John, but we made jokes about it, and we told some of our friends about what happened. One day I told a friend of mine named Brit. A cousin of hers had told her a very similar story. The cousin lived in another village about 20 miles the other direction from town. She was a few years older than us. While hitchhiking home one day, the same thing happened to her and her friend. The exhaust, the safety pin, the undone fly. It was no accident, and my worst fears were confirmed. Farmer John really was Pervert John. So this is the weirdest job interview I've ever had. This happened sometime after February 2018. My brother's community college was having a job fair, and I went, thinking, hey, this is legit. I'm gonna go, take some resumes, and see what happens. So we're at the fair, a couple of cool booths, people looking for photographers, that kind of thing. And then we come across this table. I asked them what they do. We work in contracts with entertainment, they said. I hand the guy my resume. He looks at me and puts it down. He doesn't even look at my resume. He wants to schedule an interview with me, so I agree. I have to add, at the time I wasn't doing well mentally. I was in the middle of what I now know was an emotional and mental breakdown. I wasn't eating or anything. You can kind of gather what I looked like. But nonetheless, I secure the interview, do my internet research, and find this company doesn't really have a digital footprint besides their really bare bones website. Nothing on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, indeed, nothing anywhere. The job interview was in a random building right off of a freeway. So I show up and there's no parking near the building. I park in the neighborhood close by, go to the building, and there is this guy. I'd say he was in his mid-forties, really friendly, and helps me figure out how to get to the floor I'm supposed to be on. He says he's on his way out, and I thanked him. I then proceeded up. When I get to the floor, I realize I forgot my resume. I leave the building and walk back to my car. When I make my way back to the building, I see the same guy just standing by the window of the building. He was just standing there and staring into nothing. He seemed surprised that I was behind him and not upstairs. 
I then go to the job interview, and the front desk lady is a blonde girl. She's basically in a spaghetti strap shirt and black pants, interviews me. And the strangest thing is this woman was like a tweaker. She was really skinny. She was just so thin, it didn't seem normal. Now, when I first met the guys at the job fair, they were in suits, dressed sharply, and they said they worked with DirecTV. During the interview, they basically say they're handing out Obama phones on the street. The whole office was decorated in basic Target decorations. I saw the same ones later at Target. Then the next week, they schedule me in for an interview. There is the same older guy who helped me out the previous week, but this time, he's interviewing. He has the same weird panicked look like the last time. At the front desk this day is another young woman, better dressed, but just as tweaker skinny, and much more in the... This job is so amazing. I love my job. Moved. And my interview at this time was some young guy in his early 20s wearing a suit two sizes too big. Comically so. The guy gave me an interview that was basically the same interview as before and they were going to start my onboarding. Something felt weird and told me just to say no. So I ended up bailing. But damn, does this interview still stand out in my head. I emailed the community college about it later, and basically what they told me was, we can't fix if the people at our job fairs lie to us about their jobs, which having worked at a college department that did fair jobs really concerned me. How do they not verify the people who show up? I know at my old department, they would painstakingly verify the people there, to this day, I'm still worried about this. How many other college students have met these people? What was their exact goal? Why were all the female staff so thin? Why did they have no real social media footprint for an entertainment-centered company? How many people actually fell for this? And what exactly did I almost get myself into? I walk to most places because, being severely visually impaired, obviously I can't drive. I walk at night during the summer, which lasts anywhere from April to October, if we're lucky. This is probably not the safest idea, but I'm from Texas, so temperatures of 100 degrees aren't unusual. One of my usual destinations was a convenience store a few blocks from my previous house. I set out one night to get myself some Pepsi and a candy stash. Our town isn't very big, and most people drive everywhere. It's very unusual to come across anyone else on my route to the store. But that night, a man appeared out of nowhere and started talking like he knew me. He asked me where I was going, and I told him. It wasn't unusual for people to keep watch on me because I'm a hard of hearing blind girl with forearm crutches. This guy had no reason to be there and was walking way too close beside me. He asked me where I was going and I told him, just in case I was overreacting. I sped up as much as I could since this part of the route is very dark with only a subway that had closed for the night. He definitely wasn't there for a $5 foot long. I tried to appear calm, though the alarm bells were ringing, and I was shaking to the point I was afraid I'd drop a crutch, which was probably the worst thing that could happen right then, especially after he started asking what I liked in the bedroom, and he could easily have his way with me in the ditch, and no one would know. I felt sick, but continued my walk. The store was only about 20 yards away. I knew the guy that was on the graveyard shift. I got safely inside, and my friend handed me a bag to carry my stuff in until I was ready to check out. And when I got up to the register, he began speaking loudly enough that my ears hurt, and I had to turn my hearing aids down because it hurt my ears. Hey, sweets, did you ever find my 3DS? I played along 
and he opened the half door thing and I sat on the stool like it was normal. The creepy guy came over and slammed his butt light down, followed by putting a 10 on the counter. After being handed his change, he went outside. He's still out there by the ice machine, my friend said. After about 20 minutes, he still hadn't left. My friend called his manager, and after explaining the situation, she told him to lock up and run me home. He did, and even walked me to my door. I put the key in my door, and we stepped inside. Catherine said to give you this. He handed over a keychain, and showed me how to lock and unlock the pepper spray. Call us before you come from now on. He's come in after you for the last four weeks. My friend left, and I made sure every door and window was locked. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one and are doing well. If you don't mind, hit the like button and subscribe. Drop me a comment and let me know what you thought of the stories. Oh, and don't forget to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. If you fancy checking out the perks of my Patreon or channel memberships, or want to get involved on social media, all my links are down below. I want to give a shout out to my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel, so a huge thanks to... Mr. Backwoods, Sarah C., Brenda, Sharon and Ashley, Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P., Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kel, K., Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you all on the next one.